Good morning. Welcome to the 11 a.m. public portion of the closed session of the October 12, 2021 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. If you would like to comment on a closed session item, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. In this part of the meeting, the council will receive public testimony. Thereafter, the public line will be closed and inaccessible. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. Please note, there is a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your television or you may miss your opportunity to speak. I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Members Watkins? Here. Helen Tari Johnson? Here. Brown? Here. Council Member Cummings? Here. Boulder? Here. Vice Mayor Bruner is currently absent. Um, Mayor Myers? Here. Right. I'm going to look for any members of the public who would like to speak to items on, listed on our closed session agenda today. I'm not seeing any members in the public at this time. So we will go ahead and adjourn uh, to our closed session, and uh, we will be back uh, following this item around 12, around 1 o'clock today to um, uh, begin our, our regularly scheduled items. When you, council members, when you come back in, if you could turn on your camera just so I know you're here. We'll get rolling. We still have a little bit. Need to have the annual meeting of the Board of Directors of the Industrial Authority and the Santa Cruz Public Improvement Financing Corporation. City Council members serve as board members on these boards, which were created for the purpose of providing the city an instrument to issue bonds. Annually, while the bonds are in existence, the board members are legally required to hold a meeting of the Industrial Development Authority and the Santa Cruz Public Financing Corporation. The meetings, these meetings are procedural and for the purpose of approving minutes and electing new board members. I would like, I would, I would like to call to order the October 12th, 2021 annual meeting of the Board of Directors of the Industrial Development Authority. And I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you. Directors Watkins? Here. Helen Tari Johnson? Brown? Here. Cummings? Here. Boulder? Here. Bruner? Present. And Myers? Present. We'll now move on to item number three. And I would look for a motion uh, to elect the new officers as set forth in section 3.02 of the Industrial Development Authority bylaws as follows. Executive Director, Interim City Manager, Rosemary Menard, Treasurer, Interim Director of Finance, Bobby McGee, Chair, Mayor Myers, Vice Chair, Vice Mayor Bruner, and Secretary, City Clerk Administrator, uh, Bonnie Bush. Look for a motion, please. I'll move the um, recommendation. And look for a second. Council Member Watson. I'll second that motion. Great. Okay, we have a motion by Council Member Cummings um, to move the uh, recommendation, seconded by Council Member Watkins. Uh, all those in favor, please, or I'm sorry, Bonnie, um, can we do a roll call vote? Yes, Director Watkins. Aye. 
Valentari Johnson? Aye. <clears throat> Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Holder? Aye. Bruner? Aye. And Myers? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. We'll now move on to item number four, which is the minutes of the October 13th, 2020 Industrial Development Authority. I would look for a motion to approve the minutes as submitted. Councilmember Brown, if you have to move forward. Yeah, I'll uh, move approval of the minutes. Thank you. I'll, I'll second. We have a motion for item number four, which is the minutes of the October 13th, 2020 IDA. Uh, and the motion is by Council Member Brown, seconded by Council Member Golder. Could we have a roll call vote, please? Um, Watkins? Aye. Helen Tari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Golder? Aye. Vice Chair Burr. Aye. And Chair Myers. Aye. That motion passes unanimously. We will now adjourn the meeting of the Industrial Development Authority. Hope I'm doing this right. And we will move into the annual meeting of the Board of Directors of the Santa Cruz Public Improvement Financing Corporation. All that meeting to order. October 12th, 2021, annual meeting of the Board of Directors. And I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you. Um, really quick, just for point of order for the city attorney. Do we need to take public comment for the action taken for these two boards? Um, technically, we probably should have asked for public comment. Should I go backwards, Tony? Um, I, I think it would be appropriate to ask if there's any member of the public that would like to comment on it, and then the council could potentially reconsider the actions that were already taken. If there's anyone, if there's a member of the public who would like to comment on items number three and four on our agenda today, which is under the annual meeting of the Board of Directors of the Industrial Development Authority, item three being the election of officers and item the minutes of the October 13th, 2020 Industrial Development Authority. If you please raise your hand by pressing star nine. I'm not seeing anyone raising their hands. So we'll go ahead and um, we'll re-adjourn. We'll, we will adjourn now from the Industrial Development Authority and move into the I'll call to order the October 2021 annual meeting of the Board of Directors of the Santa Cruz Public Improvement Financing Corporation. And I'd like the clerk to please call the roll. Um, Watkins? Here. Helen Terry Johnson? Here. Here. Coming? Here. Yeah. Holder? Here. Bruner? Present. And Myers? Here. Thank you. I'm going to move on to item number five, which is the election of officers. This is a motion to elect new officers as set forth in section 3.02 of the Santa Cruz Public Improvement Corporation bylaws as follows. The Chief, Chief Executive Officer is Interim City Manager Rosemary Menard. Our Chief Financial Officer is Interim Director of Finance Bobby McGee. President will be Mayor Myers. The Vice President will be Vice Mayor Bruner. And the Secretary Treasurer is City Clerk Administrator Bonnie Bush. I'm now looking for a motion on this. Council, members, Council Member Watkins, I move the recommendation. And Vice Mayor Bruner. I will second the recommendation. 
I have a motion to approve the election of officers as proposed, and I'd like to ask for a roll call vote. Thank you. Um, Watkins? Aye. Helen Harry Johnson? Aye. Um, Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Holder? Aye. Vice President Bruner? Aye. And President Myers? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. We'll move now to item number six, which is the minutes of the October 13th, 2020 Santa Cruz Public Improvement Finance Corporation. I'd be looking for a motion to approve those minutes. Council Member Watkins? I'll move approval. And I'll second that. Uh, okay, I have a motion on the floor uh, to move the recommendation of item number for the meeting minutes. And yeah. yep. That's a good point of order real quick. I was just wondering, do we have to take this out to public comment as well? Or just so that we don't have to go back. Yeah. Do we have to go back out? Yep. I'll take that. If anyone is in our audience today that would like to speak on items number five and six, which is the election of to the Santa Cruz Public Improvement Financing Corporation. And item six is the minutes of the October 13th Public Improvement Finance Corporation. If you could please press star nine to raise your hand. We're not seeing any, so I'll go ahead and bring it back. We have a motion on the table for item number uh, minutes of the October 13th, 2020 Santa Cruz Public Improvement Finance Corporation. That motion was made by Council Member Watkins, seconded by Mayor Myers. And I'd go ahead and do a roll call vote, please. Thank you. Watkins? Aye. Helen Tory Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Holder? Aye. Vice President Bruner? Aye. And President Myers? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Good afternoon. Uh, we're now going into our regular city council uh, meeting. To this is our regular session of the October 12th, 2021 meeting of Santa Cruz City Council. I have a few announcements and then we will move on to our meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, call in at the beginning of the item you are wanting to comment on using the instructions on your screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. Please note, there is a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. When it is time for comment, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak during public comment, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. You may hang up once you have commented on your item of interest. And I would like the clerk to please call the roll. Council members Watkins? Here. Helen Terry Johnson? Here. Brown? Here. Cummings? Here. Holder? Here. Vice Mayor Bruner? Present. And Mayor Myers? Present. Okay. We will now move on to a presentation today. And I am just pulling up proclamation presentation today. Give me one minute here. Here. Okay, item number seven on our presentation agenda today is a mayoral proclamation declaring October as domestic violence. 
Earnest Month, and an acknowledgement of the 40th anniversary of the of the um, committee Commission for Prevention of Violence Against Women. Go ahead and read the proclamation, and I believe potentially the chair of the commission is in the audience today, so I want to recognize her. Anne Simonton is here, I believe. This is a mayor's proclamation. Whereas Domestic Violence Awareness Month began as a Day of Unity event in October 1981 under the auspices of the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, and whereas the annual Day of Unity soon grew to a week-long observance, and since October 1987, it has been observed as Domestic Violence Awareness Month, promoting activities at the local, state, and national level. And whereas by formal action by the Santa Cruz City Council via ordinance number 881-29 in 1981, the Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women was established. And whereas the CPDAW held its first meeting on January 18, 1982, and immediately created a direct liaison with the District Attorney's Office and the Santa Cruz Police Department, participated in the hiring process for the new police chief and created and distributed a bilingual women's resource card. And whereas the CPVAW has contributed greatly to the Santa Cruz community since its formation, a sexual assault response team, teaching self-defense classes, focusing on its long-term planning, producing a film and video series, and working with the Santa Cruz Police Department to enable survivors of domestic violence to obtain an emergency protective order at the scene, and whereas the CPA, CPVAW's contributions also include a report about the earthquake and its impact against women, improving services for Latina survivors, co-sponsoring Take Back the Night, which attracted 300 attendees, providing self-defense classes for hundreds of women, providing support for homeless women, creating the Purple Ribbon Campaign, and responding to the rates of elderly women in the community with teach-ins and media coverage. And whereas the CPVAW developed a dating violence awareness and prevention support group for students, organized and sponsored Teens Men Day and Teen Women's Day, celebrated its 20th anniversary, recognized the first Denim Day in Santa Cruz, distributed educational coasters to local and dedicated a tree at Harvey West Park to honor survivors, survivors of domestic violence. And whereas this year is the 40th anniversary of the CPVAW, and to mark this occasion, the CPVAW is hosting the Cyber Abuse and How to Stop It event, which invites internationally known panelists to educate the community on how to avoid cyber and their use of revenge porn, GPS tracking, doxing, and cyberbullying. Now, therefore, I, Donna Myers, Mayor of the City of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim the month of October 2021 as Domestic Violence Awareness Month in the City of Santa Cruz and encourage all residents to join me in commending the CPVAW for decades of continued dedication to raise awareness and prevent violence and celebrating its 40th anniversary. Great. So I say, and Ann, I see you're here, and yep. I would be more than thrilled to have you say a few words. Okay. And we look forward to the event as well next next week. And please uh, let everybody know the time of that and how they can how they can find out the information. Please. So welcome. Okay. okay. Thank you so much, and thank you for this wonderful proclamation. It's so important. Uh, I think the city of Santa Cruz should be very proud of supporting supporting CPVAW especially because of the 40 years as a commission. I'm honored to be on the commission, working as the chair. And this is an extraordinary time in our history. We have an increasing, increasing need to prevent male sexual violence. Sexual assault and violence continues to be a major health crisis in our community and the world. And it's been exacerbated by the pandemic, economic uncertainties that many communities face. Santa Cruz has seen huge increases in the need for domestic violence services. Delphine Burns, one of our former 
vice chair, uh, wrote an eloquent piece in the Good Times last July on the importance of using the term femicide to distinguish the intentional murder of women by men who are intimate partners or single out women to kill. We hope the council will be pleased with a lot of the work that we've been doing lately. We have uh, posters and um, we've accomplished a lot this far. And we also hope that you'll be equally excited about the projects that we have in store for our community. CPVAW is an advocacy and educational commission, and we would love the council to consider finding any small space uh, in the city that, where we can continue to do our work in a more way as it has been in years past. Student interns could work as to keep the doors open. Anyway, next we have Commissioner uh, Roya Paksad, who's been an amazing addition to CPVAW and a tireless organizer for this upcoming event. She's the founder and director of Taraz, a research and advocacy organization at the intersection of technology and human rights. Much gratitude to the whole council for their continued support and welcome, Roya. Thank you welcome, very much. Thank you very much, Chair Simonton and Mayor and the council members. I'm very happy to be here and I'm going to share my screen to speak more about that we have been planning for the past uh, three months. So as the mayor and also Chair Simonton mentioned, October is the Domestic Violence Awareness Month. In addition to the Cybersecurity Awareness Month, it has been the 18th anniversary of Cybersecurity Awareness Month and recognized to pay more attention to the issues around safety and security in online space. And especially now that we have ever growing reliance and dependence on online platforms. As a result, we at the commission, we decided to organize an event to merge in these two issues. And by issues, I mean some of the issues that mentioned by the mayor, including cyber stalking that are facilitated by GPS enabled apps, hurtful phone plans, controlling the smart home devices by intimate partners and domestic partners, malicious software such as espouseware and stockware, issues that we have all witnessed on social media platforms, including harassment, doxing, cyberbullying that is very prevalent, especially against teens. Online revenge porn. Online sexual exploitation that are facilitated by social media platforms and the other online platforms that result in sex trafficking, human trafficking, exploitation, and webcamming, escorting. And last but not least, mobile apps, including dating apps, ride-sharing apps, that they had implications on safety and security of women and also their privacy. So what is our event? This is the flyer of our event. It is called Cyber Abuse and How to Stop It. The event will take place on Friday, October 22nd. It's a three hours event, 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. It's free on Zoom. Thanks to our partner, Monarch Services, we will have live Spanish translation at, it, at our, our event. And the event will be a series of presentation, a panel discussion, a workshop by organization, including Coalition Against Trafficking in Women, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, Polaris Project, Ending the Game, Trans Lifeline, and Cornell University's Clinic to End Tech Abuse. And these are all national and international organizations that we have been working on by the speakers from. Many thanks to our community partners and our co-sponsors, including Monarch Services. As I mentioned, Monarch is providing free live Spanish translation at our event. Walnut Avenue Family and Women's Center, Kid Power, uh, Sheriff County, uh, County Sheriff Office, Sexual Assault Response Team, or SARS, and Thank you to Santa Cruz Sentinel for publicity support and advertising. So what we want from you is please join us to this event. We will share the link with you. We will share the flyer, both digital and also the physical ones. It's free and it's online and with the Spanish translation. And you have the platform. Please share this event on your, your platform. We will be very grateful. Thank you very much for your time. 
Thank you, Commissioner Poxod and Chair Simonton. And um, we certainly will use all of our social media folks uh, or facilities as council members to try to get the word out and really looking forward to the event next week. Thank you for all your work. Uh, we so appreciate it. And it really is a, a great thing to celebrate that this little town has had this commission in place for so for four decades. So thank you for all your work. Thank you all. Thanks. Okay. Uh, we can, um, yeah, I've got council members would love to say a few, few couple minutes. Um, I'll go just down my line as I see you on the screen. Council member Golder. Thank you guys for all your work and for your presentation. I really appreciate it. Um, I, I, I really like how you mentioned um, human trafficking. And I think that it's a lot in the states than people acknowledge. And I, I know there's been cases here in Santa Cruz. And I just wonder if there's, if there's any time or way that you guys can incorporate that into the work that you do. Because I, um, you know, it's, it's modern day slavery and it's, it's disgusting and, um, I, you know, <laughs> I just like to say that um, what we need is a vice squad and uh, the Santa Cruz Police Department, and we haven't had that for years. That's really how you find out about these uh, these uh, instances, and so that's just a heads up. Hopefully, <laughs> we could get that together. Thank, Thank you, you. Uh, Councilmember Cummings. Yeah, and I just wanted to thank you and the commissioners for all the amazing work you do. And, and I want to call out um, the signage that's been produced by the commission around, um, you know, if uh, it's really going out to a lot of the bars that's suggesting, like, if you're a woman and you're in a bad relationship and you're in a, um, you know, if you're in an unsafe relationship, here's a number you call. And then also a lot of the flyers that are going out there targeting the men saying, you know, hey, it's, you know, you need to be respectful, you need to be gentlemen. Um, I think that those, uh, I've never seen that before, you know, in all the years that I've been going out to, you know, places. And um, and it's just really reassuring to see that that message is going out. And, and I think that there's a lot of, of men out there who appreciate having that message out there, too, so that we can hold other men accountable and make sure that they're being respectful to women. So just wanted to say how much I appreciated all the signage and information you all are putting out there to try to get people help if they are in a bad circumstance. And then also, you know, to push that education around men needing to be more respectful to women. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Kalantari Johnson. I would also like to um, echo my colleagues' remarks and thank you for the work that you are doing and continue to do. Um, Chair Simonin and, and Commissioner Pock, bringing this, this presentation forward to our community where we can see really the intersection of um, what's happening in the cyber world and um, prevention of violence against women. It's, I mean, it's so relevant and it's so important. And these are issues that are very challenging to face and talk about. So um, thank you for your work and the courage that it takes to bring that forward. Um, I know that, that Council Member Golder brought up human trafficking. I know similarly uh, commercial sexual exploitation of children is an area that our county and our region is starting to look at more deeply. And, and although we don't have a great way of tracking it now, we're, we're getting there. Um, so I hope that this will be integrated into some of the work that you do in the coming months and coming years. So just again, thank you for all the incredible work. Great to have you here today. Thank you so much. Vice Mayor Bruner. Thank you, Commissioner Poxod and Simon Tin. Uh, that was a great update and information and presentation. I um, My first question is, what is doxing? I've never heard that term. Is Roya here? So, yeah, yeah. So, yes, definitely. So doxing name when they share your name and your address and your phone number on social media platforms. So people, they actually, they can find you physically and harass you and harm you. That is called doxing. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I, I'm glad that you brought up all of those examples because I think it's very typical to think of um, specific instances of violence. And as, as we see and as you listed, it comes in many forms. And there is also violence against men in domestic relationships. And um, I'm glad that was all incorporated. 
And I'd like to call out also on our city website, the Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women page, because there are further links to resources such as Monarch Services and some of the the information that you brought up. So just for everybody out there, there is on the City of Santa Cruz website um, link to the page for this commission with further links and information. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Vice Chair. Councilmember Watkins and then Councilmember Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I too just want to extend my gratitude and appreciation to the commission and to you both for being here and sharing out with us. Um, I served on the Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women for many years, so it holds like a special place in my heart. It's so great to know that the work is continuing in such a meaningful way that the partnerships are um, even stronger in terms of the various <coughs> organizations who align with this work that we are committed to. And um, to Vice Mayor Bruner's point, and we're evolving as well as, as technology comes into play and all of the other forms of violence now um, take place in different ways than when I first started in 2009. So I, it is a truly remarkable thing that the city has in place that is was voted on at one point by our residents, which is unique to our city, but also really speaks volumes to our commitment to supporting um, the prevention of violence against women and continuing to maintain that support in all forms as the, it changes um, in terms of the different elements of how it is, is now being um, harming harming people. Uh, anyhow, thank you very much for your presentation. Really quickly, so it's on the 22nd, but remind me the time. 9 to 12 a.m. Uh, 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. And Council Member Brown. I'll just add my appreciation and, you know, just um, really impressed with the, that you're doing. Um, the event looks like it's going to be wonderful. You know, I, I just, I just want to say, you know, this, this commission, the service that um, the volunteer commissioners provide in our community, you know, and all of the time that I've, I've been working on uh, these issues, you know, related issues in our community, I've just been so impressed with, um, the body itself, the the time that you all put in, you know, it, it is a it's a special advisory body because you do this, you have this education and outreach role that really does um, involve engaging with the community in um, in ways that are, are are really challenging and also so critical. And I know that work has been um, further challenged uh, in our uh, somewhat social isolation over the past. Uh, year and a half now, or almost two years now, um, and and so and you all have just carried on and and found ways to make the work you know relevant and get it out there. And um, so I just I just really can't thank you enough for for what you're doing. And I'm very much looking forward to the event. And now that we're back out, um, as Councilmember Cummings uh, suggested, seeing the, the materials out there that for that people actually see and are reminders for us and, and, you know, resources for us out in the world. So really appreciate your work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Council Member Brown. Great. Well, I think you'll have, uh, I think you have some attendees lining up here for the, for the really, really important work that you're going to do next Friday. So thank you again. We all celebrate with you. Wish it was in person, but we'll do it virtual. So thank you so much. Have a great event. Thank you. Okay, we will move on to um, the next item on our uh, agenda, and I have a few announcements to make, and then we will move on to the regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on Community Television Channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofstandardcruise.com. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, instructions are provided on your screen. We will provide these instructions throughout the meeting whenever we move into an agenda item that will be opened up for public comment. Please note, public comment is heard only on items council is taking action on and not regular updates and reports. The items that will be opened for public comment today during today's meeting are numbers 10 through 18 on our agenda. Are there any council members that have any statements of disqualification today? I'm seeing no hands. 
So I will go ahead and move on to uh, ask the clerk if we have any uh, additions or deletions today on our agenda. We do not. Thank you. I'll now make an announcement about oral communications. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not on the agenda. Oral communications will occur immediately after agenda item 17. If you wish to make a comment during oral communications, please call in towards the end of item 17. I'll now ask uh, for the city attorney to provide a report on our closed session today. Tony, are you there? Can you guys hear me? Rosemary, are you? Um, I'm sorry, I'm having some trouble navigating back to the... Um, no worries. Uh, there were three items uh, discussed in the session this morning, which began um, via Zoom at 11 a.m. The first item was <clears throat> relating to the recruitment of the city manager position, uh, public employment, that is the category. Um, the second two items were relating to significant exposure to litigation, and the city council received a report from uh, the city attorney's office, uh, but there was no reportable action. Thank you, Mr. Kondati. I'll now move on to um, our uh, city manager report. The city manager will report and provide updates on the city's business, COVID-19 response, and events. I'd like to um, call on our interim city manager, Rosemary Menard. Thank you, Myers, Vice Mayor Bruner, council members. Um, I've got a relatively short report for you today. We're going to have, uh, first, we're going to have Chief Odie, who's going to give us an update on COVID, and second, you're going to hear from Lee Butler, a deputy um, city manager and uh, housing and community development, or community development planning director, and he's going to introduce to you our new um, homelessness resources manager. So with that, I'll turn it over to Chief Odie. Hello, Mayor Myers, uh, Vice Mayor Brunner, and council members. Good afternoon. I want to start off by apologizing for my presentation two weeks ago, um, marred by some technical difficulties um, while I was attending an arson conference down south. Um, the facility had an uh, internet connection, so hopefully today, in the comfort of my office with a robust internet connection and a freshly shaven face, sans mustache, um, I'll give you guys the update on COVID for the county. Um, so, as we, as we know, um, since the, the mask mandate was rescinded, the Santa Cruz County Health Officer is looking um, at our recent results optimistically. For the last 14 days, we've seen a 21% decrease in the number of cases. Um, so, we keep seeing double-digit decreases every two weeks, um, which, of course, has led to the uh, removal of the mask mandate. Um, transmissibility at this point is moderate. Um, the most cases that we see spreading are person-to-person um, -person and community spread, um, second only to person-to-person -person and household. That's sort of a flip pandemic. So again, we see that at these um, large events, um, both indoor and outdoor. Um, and of course, as we move into the flu season and um, holidays, we want to be very mindful of that. Um, and of course, as you can see in the next bullet point, um, the county, while they did rescind the mask mandate, they still strongly recommend it. And I know many of you have been out in the community and seen many businesses that are still um, asking that we do so. And I think it's a good idea. Um, most of the cases we're seeing are, um, and again, mostly in the white and Latin, Latinx population, um, usually or typically in the 25 to 44 year old category. So it's still a lot of work to do um, in terms of um, preventing the spread of the disease. Uh, with that, we've seen over 375,000 vaccine doses administered in the county. That's up to about 71% of the population have had at least one dose. So we're seeing about four to 500 doses administered every day. And of course, an increase of 7,000 doses administered every week. So we're seeing a small uptick. We still have lots of work to do. And of course, we'll see a significant change once um, the um, children by ages 5 to 11 um, have been finally approved with the emergency use, uh, use authorization to receive the dose. We'll see a significant increase in the number of vaccinations countywide. 
Uh, most recently, we had two deaths in the county. Um, oddly enough, they were both vaccinated, but it's important to note um, that they were both uh, well over 60 with some serious health conditions and comorbid factors that um, you know, lent themselves to um, that unfortunate demise. Um, so next slide. So this is the, um, again, provided from the Santa Cruz County Health website. Um, it's the most up-to-date information. Um, I've, what I've done is um, tailored this strictly to the Delta surge itself, selected the date range of July 2nd through um, uh, October 6th. And so it sort of shows you how we had that spike and the orange line helps denote the uh, leveling or flattening of the curve, so to speak. So again, showing that we're um, in the right direction. Um, and then of course, the graph on the right um, supports the information that I was talking about, 61% of the spread is person to person in community acquired um, situations, second only to person to person in household at 21% spread. Next slide. Uh, so again, as I mentioned, we've continued to see a double digit decrease in new COVID cases every 14 days. And so this graph just shows that we're trending, uh, continuing to trend in the right direction, which is downward um, and I've seen a decrease in uh, up to 21% in terms of um, spreading new COVID cases. Next slide. And um, again, in terms of transmissibility, um, this is the graph that sort of shows we wanna be below one. So as you can see, currently we're in the green. We're just above 0.75. Um, that was sort of the gold standard that we had in early summer and we're hoping to get to, and of course, um, want to maintain um, a number below one, in which we are doing at this point and want to continue to do so. Next slide. Um, in terms of vaccinations, again, I talked about we're up to about 375,000 doses administered. This graph shows that, again, 71% of the population has received at least one dose. And uh, currently, the fully vaccinated total is about 65.4%. So in this graph, the light blue is fully vaccinated and the gray are those that are sort of in that transition of having one shot and are waiting to receive their second. And of course, we'll see um, a significant surge in overall vaccinations um, once children ages five to 11 are allowed to receive it. Next slide. Um, this was just to point out in terms of the discussion you may or may not have with people in terms of being vaccinated or unvaccinated. Um, this was a slide that I pulled from the uh, California Department of Public Health. And it just basically shows you that during the time period of September 19th to the 25th, unvaccinated people were 7.1 times more likely to get COVID than those that were fully vaccinated. So again, um, sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words. And in this case, this graph sort of shows just that. Um, and I think it's important to note that in terms of during getting um, vaccinations, um, the Santa Cruz City Schools will be starting um, doing drive-through vaccinations starting November 1st. So again, um, we're gonna see a significant uptick in the number of vaccinations in the county. Next slide. And when we're talking about vaccinations, um, there's a uh, constant discussion, um, most recent booster doses. <laughs> and of course, with anything in the pandemic, we wanna make sure that we're using proper terminology. There's booster dose and some might hear additional dose. Um, there is a, a distinction between the two. Of course, booster dose is something that you receive six months after receiving the uh, first series. Um, as of right now, Pfizer is the only one that has approval for booster doses, and uh, we're seeing that right now, ages 65 in that. And we're also seeing um, that people that are ages 18 to 64, that again are in the public eye in terms of public transit, uh, grocery store, food service workers, education, first responders are eligible for that. I will note that in this county, um, a lot of the first responders received Moderna, so we're still awaiting approval, emergency use authorization approval from the FDA. Um, and as of right now, they're meeting Thursday for approval for the Moderna booster and Friday for Johnson & Johnson. And of course, there will be discussions um, in the FDA realm about mixing um, different uh, vaccinations. And then of course, <clears throat> the distinction between additional dose, if you hear that, that's for people who are severely immunocompromised due to cancer, organ transplant, stem cell, transplants or other things. And of course, they, they are counseled by their personal physician and they receive this additional dose, not a booster, 28 days after receiving their uh, two dose series of Pfizer or Moderna. So just wanna make that distinction as you're having these discussions out there with people um, in the public. Next slide. 
And so again, just want to um, point you to the SantaCruzHealth.org. That's where I get a lot of my information. Extremely useful and very um, up to date. Um, that as well as the California Department of Public Health, where you can find a bunch of different links about recent state health officer orders. And with that, that's all I have for the COVID update, unless you have any questions. Is there any questions for Chief Odie? The one thing, um, Chief, that I learned last week in the, in the um, mayor's meeting, I'm not, I have to admit, I'm not, I don't think I saw it in your slides. Um, just wanted the public to know that, and Rosemary, you can uh, help me with this. I believe that the civic auditorium test site on October 15th, but that that's correct. we're trying to move it to the depot park um, building. Is that correct? Yes, but the depot park uh, building had a water leak site. So I think right now there's some efforts to look for a mobile testing site, possibly in the civic parking lot, I think. Okay, yeah, I just wanted to confirm that. I just learned that last week. I know a lot of people use the civic for their testing site, so. Right, it will be replaced by something that is um, will be announced, but I think that that's what they're working on at the moment. So there isn't a gap. Uh, Mayor Myers, it's also um, worth noting that there's still two other sites. Um, you know, we still have the Watsonville site and the Felton site that are served by OptumServe, the same uh, service provider at the Civic, as well as Santa Cruz City Schools wants to put it out there that obviously they're doing testing for their school families and they sort of have made the point of saying they use that term loosely in terms of they have their students, their immediate family, and then of course there are those that are um, that interact with the family, whether it's a caregiver or extended family. So um, those are options. Um, also, the Santa Cruz City Schools website, they also have testing available. And I think many of us in this room probably would qualify for that just by nature of having some children or family that are associated with the schools. Thank you, Chief. Is there any questions at all or? Okay, thanks. Thanks again. Good to see you, Rob. <laughs> okay. Um, so now, um, Tilly Butler. Thank you, Rosemary, and good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Today, I am very pleased to introduce to you Larry M. Wally. And let's see, here he is. Um, Larry joined us last week as our Homelessness Response Manager. Larry um, did his undergraduate in political science at UCLA and political science at um, the University of Arizona and um, has various other uh, educational backgrounds that are going to help him succeed here um, in this role. He um, came to us from the Action Council of Monterey County. He was the executive director there for 14 years. And they work on a variety of um, social change initiatives. They're kind of an umbrella organization that incubates smaller um, nonprofits. And we are very pleased to welcome Larry to the team and build capacity with our homelessness response work. Um, one of the first things that he will be working on is the um, council direction to get the safe sleeping sites and storage sites up and running. Um, and I spoke with you briefly at the last council meeting and um, let you know there might be some changes with respect to the armory. I think the council was where we were looking at the armory as uh, the inside there as a location for our um, safe sleeping sites. And um, the county was planning to close down their operations at the end of this month inside of that. The, the county is now um, looking at continuing that operation, so that's a good thing. They are continuing to serve those individuals, and we are working on a partnership with them on um, various ways in which we can support that effort up there, as well as um, recalibrating the best approach to our safe sleeping now that it will not be on the interior of the Marine building. But um, I want to welcome Larry, and um, I'd welcome any questions that the council may have. Larry, would you like to would you like to say hello and make a few comments? Sure. Um, good afternoon, Mayor and members of council. Um, it's a pleasure to meet all of you, and uh, yeah, I'm just excited to be joining the city in this role. And uh, I've had a 
great uh, orientation. I'm starting week two, um, but uh, it's been great to work with everybody, and I look forward to working with all of you on this issue. Thank Welcome, you. Larry. Yeah, we're really great to have you here as part of the team. So, uh, Rosemary, do you want to have any um, comments or questions from council at all? Or Sure. I mean, if, if folks would like to say something, I think we have enough time because we're, we're fairly concise today. Yeah. Okay, I've not seen any raised hand. Um, I do have a question, um, Lee, for we did receive some communications from the public on um, sort of the wind down of the of the bench lens um, and a little bit around what may be happening and how the transitioning may be happening, both I think for the bench lens camp as well as some of the folks that are up near the cemetery. So I don't know how that sort of, and maybe you don't have that answer today and that's totally fine. We can get an update next in two weeks, but just curious if there's any um, updates on that at all. Sure, that is certainly a, um important topic of conversation among our team, and um, we are continuing to assess the, the rain situation because we know that there are um, issues with the proximity to the river and the potential for flooding in those areas, um, as well as um, the availability of a place like a, a safe sleeping um, opportunity that we are looking to establish. Um, so we have um, we have some internal meetings scheduled later this month where we will be um, continuing that conversation. We've had a number of them that have focused on these specific issues, but we are um, continuing to um, uh, consider that um, and the next steps associated with that with the variety of factors that, that I mentioned. Okay. Okay, great. And, um, and then Mayor Myers, I think finally, I'll just make a, a public that um, today there was an announcement that uh, Andy Mills, our police chief, has resigned and he's going to be moving to the, be the chief of police in Palm Springs, California. So we are um, going to be, I will be making a decision about an interim appointment here shortly and starting to look at, you know, recruitment strategies over time, what have you. So. I know that many in the community are already uh, aware of this, but I did want to take an opportunity to make that public announcement here. Thank you, Rosemary. Are there any questions from council for our city manager today? I'm not seeing any. Okay, thank you, Rosemary. I had a, okay. I had a question. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, Rosemary, I'm wondering, um, I guess, or I, sh I won't pose this in the form of a question. I'll just make a, a comment. I'm wondering if there might be a role, as you're thinking about um, the hiring of the next police chief, I'm just wondering if there might be a role that the Public Safety Committee could play in that process. And so just wanted to put that out there in case um, that might be a way for uh, that committee to be engaged in that process. Um, and um, I know that there's... I've been getting contacted by a number of community members already who are kind of interested in what that process is going to be like and how people, especially those that have really had negative interactions with law enforcement and, and might be concerned about, you know, who we bring in, um, if there's any way that we can direct them to opportunities to um, engage and provide feedback or be a part of that process for hiring a new police chief. Just want to put that out there that many people are interested in being engaged in the process. Thank you. I'll take that under advisement. Um, I think I think for even the number of other sort of interim roles that are in the queue to be filled, I suspect we'll have an interim for a little while anyway, but that will give some time. Thank you. Okay. Great. Okay. We will now move on to the city uh, council meeting calendar. Uh, and I'll call on the clerk now to provide any updates to the calendar. There are no updates. Okay, thank you, Bonnie. Okay, first up today is our consent agenda, and these are items 10 through 15 on our agenda. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, now is the time to call in if you want to call 10 through 15. Instructions are on your screen. 
Please remember to mute your streaming device, press star nine to raise your hand, and listen for the cue saying you have been unmuted. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who wish to comment or pull on any items? See Council Member Cummings and Council Member Contrary Johnson. Council Member Cummings? I'd like to pull item number 10, and I have a comment on item number 13. Or I have questions, sorry, for item number 13. Okay. And Council Member Contrary Johnson? I had questions on item 10, so. Question on item 10. Okay. Okay, we have had item 10 pulled. And we have comments, a comment, or excuse me, questions on item 10 and 13. So, um, Councilmember Collintari Johnson, you can go ahead and ask your questions as we after it's pulled. Uh, if there are any members of the public that would like to speak to any item consent agenda, with the exception of items pulled by our council member, our council member, which is item 10 today, now is the time to raise your hand. I'm going to take a. Uh, Council Member Cummings, question on uh, item number 13, and then I will take this out for public uh, comment. Council Member Cummings, you had a question on item number 13. Which Thank for you. the public is, turn the page here, which is the council, City Council Ad Hoc Revenue Committee. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I had a question um, for the, um, maybe this is for the city attorney or for the city manager. Um, just out of curiosity around, you know, putting um, ballot measures, move, getting ballot measures moved forward, I'm just wondering um, if we were to put an item on the June or November election ballots, would that require us to, de to declare a fiscal emergency, which my understanding is that that requires seven votes of the city council, or would it just be a majority vote to put um, a, ballot, uh, a revenue measure on either of the ballots? So the requirement for, decla um, for declaring a fiscal emergency is if there is a uh, revenue measure that does not co coincide with a city council election. So the answer is no for November 2022 and yes for the June uh, primary election. You would need to declare a fiscal emergency in, uh, to add a revenue measure to the June 2022 ballot, yes. Okay, and then my next question is, um, I'm wondering about the cost. Because so in the last time we had the um, we had a ad hoc revenue committee, we the committee worked with um, consultants, and I'm just curious about what the costs are. Because I guess where I'm going with this is that we just we just went through the process of trying to bring forward a revenue measure that was not, and we were not able to get. Um, Seven votes for that, and so one of the things that I'm concerned with is, you know, if we go through this process again and then we're unable to put an item on the ballot, you know, are we going to, you know, consistently be spending, you know, potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars working with consultants to then not be able to get something moved forward? And so I just wanted to get a sense of, you know, what those costs are in order for us to, to work with consultants, or if that's a, if, if that, or if that is, um, is anticipated. Um, I'm, I'm going to uh, take that question, and I'm going to actually ask Schmidt, who um, worked with the Ad Hoc Revenue Subcommittee from earlier, to um, address that. Um, thanks, Council Member Cummings. So as far as the potential success um, of a revenue ballot measure recommendation to council. That's something that the, any ad hoc committee will try to get addressed throughout deliberation, research, and recommendation process. And um, I think any six-figure expenditure that the city incurs in potential uh, getting a return on that, uh, potentially millions of dollars, to be able to help at last count in May, a one to potentially $5 million deficit per year over the years. I think it's um, something that we, it's a good investment of staff and council member time to do. Regarding the specific costs related to the last proposed sales tax revenue measure, 
um, the six-figure number relates to the cost of an election. So the cost of an election in an off-cycle council year, um, where there are also other that don't have a lot on the ballot, uh, we incur those costs uh, working with the county to be able to launch the election. Uh, the other cost that we occurred in the last go around was approximately $30,000 for a poll, for uh, a community poll. And additionally to that, we had an, another approximate $30,000 with uh, props and measures to help us do the education and um, staff education and outreach for the community of what the sales tax measure was not campaigning, but just the educational portion that we are allowed to do um, as a city. Hopefully that answers your questions. Yeah, that did. And I, I guess the last comment I'll have is that, I'm, I mean, I'm supportive of this. I just am a little, I just hope that we, when we get to the point of moving something forward that we're able to, you know, get everybody on board um, so that we don't, we're not in a position where we put all this work into trying to bring a, a a uh, revenue measure forward that then just falls short. Okay, I'll now uh, take this out to the public. So this will be for items on our consent agenda today, and that will be items 10 through uh, 15, with the exception of item, excuse me, uh, 11 through 15. Item 10 has been pulled, and we'll discuss that next. Uh, so I see phone number ending in 4844. If you could press star six to unmute yourself, you should be able to speak. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, well, it's customary these days to abdicate a lot of public power to city council. And we see this in the guillotining of much public comment time generally, but what I'm requesting here is that item 11, I'm glad item 10 has been already been removed, thank you, by a council member for staff report and public comment. Now, I believe council member Sandy Brown committed herself to removing items at public request at the beginning of her term, and I hope she will fulfill her commitment here. The reason that I ask for this to be removed, well, it's, there's a very significant exclusion from the public of direct and in-person attendance at city council meetings has been requested by many, many members of the public. These items, obviously, so need full public discussion. And, but so as to clarify and not to take up time on this, so I'll be able to speak about it when I hope this item is removed, uh, I'm requesting council members really concerned about public comment open up uh, the agenda generally, but this item particularly for this particular council meeting. We're talking about the one that involves continued zooming of these meetings instead of essentially public involvement in person. Thank you. Thank you. Next up we have Peter Pichet. A star six. Hello, City Council. This is uh, Peter Bichier, your community liaison. Um, I just want to speak uh, to the general, the public, and mostly the Beach Flat and Lower Ocean uh, people about item number 14, and uh, really appreciate that we're moving along uh, on this. Um, as the city representative for those uh, neighborhoods in uh, Lower Ocean and Beach Flat, the shoaling of the San Lorenzo really impacts and creates havoc throughout the community. Uh, we've had several times uh, floods that have been on basements who have been flooded with water, uh, parking lots. Uh, obviously, also it affects uh, the boardwalk. Uh, with uh, I've seen a lot of uh, kids who don't really know exactly what that water is, parking lot, and they play with their barefoot and stick their hands with these waters. Um, so I'm really glad that we're moving along, and um, it's still still to this day. I, every time I, I'm in the neighborhood, which is on a weekly basis, I see this water high up, and then I try to go down into the beach flat and lower ocean to see what the impact is. So far, things are dry, but that will definitely it, it'd be very good. And every time the things will be arranged, that there they're they're always rolling their eyes, saying, "Well, yeah, right." Well, hopefully, so it'll be amazing if that project is approved and that it will make a great difference, uh, showing that the city does um, want to improve the life quality in those two neighborhoods. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. Next up, we have Jeff Hall. 
Thank you, Peter. Is there anyone else in the meeting attendees today that would like to speak to our consent agenda? I, this is going to be items 11 through 15 today. Last call. Okay, I will go ahead and bring this back to um, the city council then. And uh, item number 10 has been pulled by council member Cummings. Um, Mayor, we need to have a vote on the 11th. Oh, you're right, I missed that. Okay, let's go ahead and I would look for a motion um, for items on our consent agenda, items uh, 11 through 15. Sandy and then Renee. I, um, just, I'll, I'll go ahead and move the consent agenda, but I wanted to make a quick comment um, to respond to the uh, request from Mr. Norse. I did say that I would pull items from the agenda upon request from the public. Um, and I didn't get any before this meeting. And um, so I, and I'm, I'm not uh, persuaded that pulling it and having a long discussion is going to change anything in this case. So I'm sorry, Mr. Norse. Um, I just want to register a note on that when the time comes, but um, I, I will move the consent agenda and you can all just text me or send me an email and I will do that in advance. Um, but I don't want to hold us up if no one's here to speak about it. So, um, and you did. Thank you, Robert. For, thank you, Mr. Norse. Um, so um, I'll go ahead and move the consent agenda uh, with the exception of. Thank you. And council member Golder. Second. Okay. We have a motion on the table to approve our consent agenda items 11 through 15. And I will go ahead and ask for a roll call vote. Oh, council member Cummings, did you have a question? Oh, okay. Roll call vote, please, Bonnie. Council members Watkins, Kalantari Johnson, Shepard, you're muted. Oh, she, she did let me know she's frozen. having internet issues, so um, she's frozen. Want to circle back to her? Yeah, I will. Um, Brown, I I would vote I. Uh, just register a no vote on item number 11. Um, Cummings? Aye. Boulder? Aye. Vice Mayor Brunner? Aye. And Mayor <coughs> Myers? Aye. And it looks like we lost Shebra. Do um, you want to, we can register well, we'll move forward. We have a uh, six, let's see, five in favor and one registered no vote for item number 11. Seeing if she comes back in, I'm not seeing her. Okay, we'll move on to item number 10, which is um, a resolution authorizing the city to implement teleconference public meetings pursuant to Assembly Bill 361. And uh, Council Member Cummings has pulled this item. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> so many members of the public have been expressing their desire to have meetings in person again. And although some people uh, have been to access meetings using Zoom, there's been a lot of people who have expressed, frust uh, expressed frustration while trying to call in to address the council. And as an elected official, I believe that we should be doing everything we can to allow the public access and participation in our meetings. At the beginning of the pandemic, it was clear that we needed to go to remote meetings due to <clears throat> the uncertainties around COVID and the need to reduce spread and keep our community safe. Today, we know how to meet safely and with the vaccine, many of us are protected from developing life-threatening symptoms from COVID-19. In addition to that, many agencies and commissions have been having hybrid meetings and full in-person in meetings, including the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. And I believe that we should follow the lead of the County Board of Supervisors and at a minimum for hybrid meetings. And so um, that's why I pulled this item is that I believe we should, um, whether it's a discussion, and I know I'm, this needs to go out to the public for a public comment before we make a motion, but um, I wanted to bring forward 
that we uh, move towards hybrid meetings and the suggestion and the consideration that we move towards hybrid meetings and reassess, um, you know, whether we want to go back to in person, we want to go back to um, fully um, remote meetings, depending on um, how the uh, COVID-19 um, um, epidemic changes over time. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, turn it over to the staff. I just I do want the public to know that um, we've actually been talking for several months about when we go, to, if and how we go to hybrid. Um, the staff has done a, a amount of work to get us ready for that. Rosemary probably will be able to update on that. Um, so I, I think that there is, um, you know, work being done to move us that direction. Certainly, I don't know if we need a motion to direct us to do that, but um, the most important thing um, right now is to make sure that the facility that we would return to is as safe as possible for any transmission. And so, um, with the type of chamber and the type of um, environment we have there, our staff has been working really, really hard to uh, assess all of those factors. And um, I'll turn it over to Rosemary. And I saw Ken was also um, yeah. Ken uh, also on. So maybe an update, um, and that might uh, answer that may address your concerns. And I'm not sure a motion would be necessary after you hear from staff. So let me um, ask Ken to give a quick update, and then I think also it might be worthwhile to hear briefly from Bonnie Bush regarding the sort of um, clerk side of the house. Uh, and, and support, but I think, Ken, you also have a couple of photos that maybe would be great if you could share. Sure, yeah, so the, the challenge obviously is when we come back into the chambers that we have three ways our uh, stream. We have a community TV, we have our on-base agenda management system, and then we have Zoom. It became much easier when we were out of the chambers. We have microphones in there, we have cameras in there. So as we return to the chambers, we still have to maintain Zoom as our primary feed to the community. So we had to figure out how to kind of get the different channels to work together. So from a technology perspective, it's <clears throat> it's not as innovative as we would have a solution. Um, and it's going to involve uh, all members that are in chambers to have a device with a, a webcam kind of pointed at them. We would have one at the lectern for the public and for the staff. Uh, we've done a couple of tests, and it seems to be uh, sufficient. Uh, we're hoping that there's some technology in the pipeline that can kind of <clears throat> help meet this challenge. I know a lot of other communities that are out there are facing the same challenge. Uh, some communities are going back to in-person only, but um, <clears throat> so whatever we choose to do, I believe we'll have a solution that can get us there in the interim. Uh, Rosemary mentioned a picture. I think also one of the challenges is the plastic dividers <clears throat> that are in there make it kind of feel like you're in a hockey rink. Um, you can see that the dividers on each side extend out all the way here to kind of protect you from your, your partner that's sitting next to you. So it definitely has kind of a feel of claustrophobia um, and there's a little bit of an echo, kind of like you're going through the, the, the drive through at Jack in the Box. Um, <clears throat> but I guess the bottom line is, you know, this is kind of what we're, what we're looking at. Thank you, Ken. And yeah, I think it's just to be clear that the item today was not to, um, was really to also acknowledge um, the requirements under AB 361, but never an intention to not try to get us back into some kind of hybrid situation. So um, it's just, as you can see, pretty complicated in that room and we'll be uh, sitting in some interesting quarters as we can move forward. Any other questions or comments from council member on uh, item number 10, which is the uh, resolution authorizing the city to implement teleconference public meetings pursuant to assembly bill 361. And, and mayor Mize, I would urge everyone to drop by the chambers. We would, if we do go this route, like to have uh, a test run with council members, but just so that you have an idea on what the configuration looks like and how it feels and any feedback you might have. Uh, I think that would be important. And just Rosemary, for our, maybe for council members kind of knowledge and Ken, um, thank you for all your work and Bonnie too. Um, I know we have bounced around a few dates. Do we have sort of a timeline on me going back to actual physical being in the chamber? Um, I, you know, certainly that's up to you and to some degree, but I also do want to make a, a, a sort of an ancillary comment here. The, 
as, as the IT staff and others have been working on getting it set up for the council to go back into this hybrid mode, which would allow for uh, in-person participation, but also remote participation. Uh, it's been clear that, you know, we've kind of crossed the Rubicon, if you will, from where we used to be in all, fully um, in person to uh, a remote to looking now to provide that continuing um, remote access for those people who don't want to come in person but still may want to participate in the conversation via, you know, some kind of a remote format. Um, the, many of the commissions, which didn't used to be um, televised or, you know, made available through um, the, the some kind of, you know, visual pers perspective, have taken advantage of uh, the Zoom process as well. And I think we do have some uh, issues related to how we're going to manage the commission format as we go forward, because the requirements of all this technology that would support a council meeting is really, it's not sustainable with the resource level we have to provide that same level of support for the commissions that would want to uh, maintain some kind of remote access. We still have a couple of uh, issues there to sort through in terms of the long range strategy for how we're going to you know, support the commission process and try to keep up with the 21st century reality that we find ourselves in. Um, and I know that it's not it's not possible for IT to support that. It's not reasonable in that setting. Um, but we have created there's a lot of expectations for the in the people in the community who want to participate remotely, wouldn't participate if they had to come in person. And it's sort of the opposite side of the same issue that we're, you know, that we started talking about here about the people who want to come in person. So I think that, that for the council meetings, it's really up to you when you're ready to go back to that format. I think we would want to set that up in a way that would give us adequate time to make sure that you've had a chance to do a, um, a, a sort of a practice session in the, in the chambers uh, because it's not all straightforward and, you know, get the feel of it. And then I think we would want to uh, make a decision about uh, a date to start up. Thank you, Rosemary. Councilmember Brown. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you, Rosemary and Ken, for the updates. I, you know, I really want to just say I, 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 I'm sure there's a lot of complexity and challenges associated with um, trying to make this work and, you know, as it was when we moved to the remote format. And so I just really appreciate all the work that you all are doing. Uh, don't want to sound like I'm um, being critical of that, as I say, that I really do believe that we have a responsibility to move our meetings back into the chambers to allow pu the public access under um, safe uh, conditions. It will be rocky. What we know is that it's super rocky for a whole lot of people out there who try to uh, connect with us in these meetings. I have heard countless stories of people who just could never get in. Some of it, you know, probably operator error or, you know, challenges with the technology at the other end. But um, the the reality is there are a whole lot of people who feel like they're um, being, you know, they're, they're not able to participate as fully as they what for however we feel about that level of participation. Um, so, uh, and I recognize that it has also brought a lot of new opportunity for people to um, participate in our meetings that have not traditionally done that. So I'm, I'm thrilled that we can get to a hybrid place. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, my concern with this agenda item as written is that it basically says, um, you know, that, that we're being asked to um, authorize the use of Assembly Bill 361 to um, continue with teleconference meetings. And there's that other piece of, you know, like, well, we're, you know, we, we're, there's a few steps to get there. We, you know, we need to work out the kinks and or there are other considerations is just not here. And so it feels like setting ourselves up to do this through potentially 2024. And that is something that I think a lot of people have at least communicated to me they have a discomfort with. So, um, 
you know, I I personally, you know, we, we this came up at the RT, at the Regional Transportation Commission meeting at our last meeting, and uh, there was a general expression from commissioners that you know let's let's try to um, move forward and get back into uh, the in person meetings as at least the meeting process um, as soon as possible. And so I'd really like to see something like that indicated here today that we are not just um, using uh, Assembly Bill 361 um, because we can find a way to do that. Just to, I think it would be important for the to help the public understand that's not the intention here. Okay. Did you want to make a motion to that to that point? Yep. Or, I will. I will. I I can ask if she wants to make a motion. Perfectly so, acceptable to do that now. <laughs> yeah, thank so, you. I um. I, well, I could. Um, I'm, I'm, I've got I'm, my parliamentary I'm, procedure, and okay. I'm, we can do that if we want, or I could take it out the public comment. But I'm just appreciate. While it. Council Member Brown was stating that, I wondered if she wanted to put a motion on the floor. <laughs> I, I appreciate. I'll, I'll wait to hear from the public and uh, before we okay. make a motion gets made. Thank you. I appreciate okay. it. So. Uh, I just want to make sure, um, so the item we're um, bringing out for folks, uh, I'll open this up for um, public comment. This is going to be item number 10 on our agenda. This is the resolution authorizing legislative bodies of the City of Santa Cruz to continue the use of teleconference meetings pursuant to Assembly Bill 361, which is uh, which is uh, obviously, if we do want to do that, we, we, we need to pass Solution, but I don't know that the intent was to, to say that teleconference was our only choice moving ahead. So, um, but I'll bring it out to see if we have folks from the audience. We do have one attendee. Um, looks like Mr. Norse, uh, go ahead. And then we've got a second person I'll call on you next, Sabina. Go ahead, Mr. Norse. Um, Stars. Uh, go ahead, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay. Um, it was pointed out to me that uh, the county has already ruled that things have moved from severe to moderate, and the statement of the the actual AB 361 is, the, is that the state of emergency continues to directly impact the ability of members to meet safely in person. seems to me that there's kind of a, a potential contradiction here. Also, I mean, you have, there's a phone capacity that could be set up. There's email capacity. Even when people are meeting in person, they generally have to come in person. And you have venues where you can do this, where we have asked you, and I say we because I think many more than I have asked you to meet in the auditorium repeatedly, and you've refused to do so, given saying different things about why that's the case, and perhaps you know, perhaps repairs were needed, perhaps it wasn't entirely adequate. But the board of supervisors, although it also uses a distanced approach, allows people, or at least it did, to meet in person quite recently. So I don't, and it, it tends to give one the suspicion that you don't want people to attend. Because people who attend, you know, exercise perhaps more of a moral force and more perhaps of a political force than people who you can cut off on the phone. I'd also like to point out, by the way, that um, I'm not able to get you uh, on the either through Chrome or Firefox. And I've sent an email to that effect to Bonnie. I guess Rosemary didn't get it. But it's, you know, it is really problematic. And I think actually it can constitute a Brown Act violation if you're really excluding public in a very haphazard way, and you have other options that you are specifically choosing not to use in spite of repeated requests. And I ask the community to uh, raise its voice about this issue. Maybe the council here. Thank you. Next, I have Sabina. Hello. Uh, my name is Sabina. I'm a resident of Santa Cruz. Um, I have to say I agree with Mr. Norse that it's at least giving the impression that you guys don't want people attending these meetings. And I've talked with lots of people about this, um, especially like you guys are passing multiple ordinances one after another against the poorest people in our city. 
and you're not really allowing them to speak because they need to have a computer with Zoom in order to do it or a phone. And they're, it's just, just me. My child can go to school and be unvaccinated and be in school every single day. You guys can go to a meeting that's what every other week. Like, it's pretty ridiculous what you're asking the community to do on a regular basis versus what you will do on a regular basis. And so I'd really like you to think about that. If tiny children need to be in person every day, you guys can be in person once in a while and see what your constituents really have to say. So please start meeting in person. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other uh, any other folks in the audience that would like to speak to this? We are on item number 10 on our consent agenda. I'm not seeing any hands at this point. Uh, I'll go ahead and bring it back. We do have a motion by Council Member. Well, we were going to, uh, Council Member Bound was ready to make a motion. I want to call on Bonnie Bush real quick, our city clerk. She's got her hand up. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to address what, something that Mr. Norris said. Um, our streaming is down on our website. However, members of the public can go to community television online. The link is on the agenda in order to view the meeting, so it is not a Brown Act violation. Thank you, Bonnie. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll bring it back to Council Member Brown. So I. Thanks. I actually, um, I, Council Member Cummings had his hand up first, and we did discuss this before. I think he may be about to do what I would do, so I'm, I'll just hold off. Uh, thank you. Okay. Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and just again for members of the public, I pulled this item so that we could, you know, have this discussion and. The motion I sent it to Bonnie, um, and and I've also amended the motion based on conversations that we've had and the hearing from council members currently. Um, but the motion I would like to make would move the resolution authorizing legislative bodies of the city of Santa Cruz to continue the use of teleconference meeting pursuant to Assembly Bill 361 and that the Santa Cruz City Council shift to hybrid meetings and reconsider meeting options dependent upon the circumstances of the state of emergency every 30 days until the state of emergency has been lifted. And so the consistent with, um, this is trying to align with the staff report and what the staff is recommending and also um, taking into account community concern around um, shifting to hybrid meetings and being able to meet in person. And um, my objective with this motion is to try to meet, reach that middle ground of um, you know, needing to pass this resolution, but also express our intent to move to hybrid meetings. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Well, we have a motion on the floor um, with uh, addition to the uh, staff recommendation um, as outlined by uh, Council Member Cummings. Um, Bonnie, do you want to put that language up there just one more time just so folks understand? So this would be adding the following to after Assembly Bill 361 and that the Santa Cruz City Council shift to hybrid meetings and reconsider meeting options dependent on the circumstances of the state of emergency every 30 days until the state of emergency has been lifted. Uh, I see Rosemary Menard has her hand up. Um, the question for clarification, so this, this explicitly uh, puts the um, council meetings in the hybrid format. It does not address the issues related to um, commissions. Did you mean to be silent on the commission question? I was explicitly um, trying to address the city council, and it sounds like there's some concern around the commission. So if we need to provide further direction for staff to consider how we could, how the commissions could meet, I'd be happy to provide that. But I think at this time, what we've been hearing, what I've been hearing mostly from the members of the public is really this desire to start with the city council and getting the city council meetings public again. Um, all right, then I'm gonna interpret that as the council is the focus and that for the time being anyway, that commissions can continue <coughs> to operate in a remote mode. Correct. 
Okay. Um, Bonnie will do a roll call vote on this. Oh, it looks like Laura has her hand up. Laura? Can I please get clarification as far as the council moving to hybrid? Is that going to be considered 30 days after this particular vote gets done or is it immediate? Like when, when is that shift to hybrid supposed to happen? I, I don't know. <laughs> Personally, I think that if, if the city, if the city is ready to move, I mean, it looked like based on the pic, the photos that we were provided, that the city has the infrastructure, you know, that would allow us to move to in-person meetings. So um, maybe if, the, our IT director, if he has any input on that. We're, but it seems like if our numbers are trending down with respect to COVID cases and if the chambers have been, you know, um, allow us to meet in a safe way that, you know, the sooner we can get back, I think the community would appreciate that. So uh, I would just add uh, under the caveat that uh, council is um, dedicated to coming into the chambers and doing at least a test run uh, to become familiar with the equipment and make sure that the process for for you all, I would uh, rather not uh, go live uh, on a council meeting on the 26th. I think 30 days from now would be fine, or at the first meeting in November. Councilmember Watkins, and then Councilmember Colin Tari Johnson. Um, I just wanted to make sure if I understood, Mayor, was this also the direction that you were? Um, essentially saying that the city had been considering and moving in, is this aligned with what sort of the plans were? Um, in yeah, internally, the vice mayor and I had, had been meeting with the city manager, um, you know, the highest, um, you know, we're, I think, it, I won't speak for the vice mayor, but my concern was that, you know, we see all the, the, the signs that, you know, done. Um, there's also many people in the community that actually enjoy the tele, you know, the teleconferencing. So trying to make sure that we had the safety in the chambers needed um, for to avoid transmissions. Um, and then um, obviously, you know, give our staff the time to get ready for that, test everything. And then, but yeah, we were, we were moving this way. So I'm, but I don't know if we're going to be ready in 30 days. So, you know, uh, but I, I was leaving it up to the experts, um, primarily our staff, to determine when they were ready to to go live on the on the chamber and the the hybrid approach. So could I just add one thing related sure. to that? I think the, um, the, that what Mary just said is is absolutely what I understand to be the case as well. The one thing that we haven't talked about here is that the um, the Chambers would not necessarily be, you know, throw open the door and let it, as many people as uh, want to come in. And so there's a, a little bit of work that needs, well, more props more than a little bit, but there's some, you know, work that has to get done to figure out how to um, let people come in and meter people in and meter people out uh, in terms of the public comments. So, um, you know, this is, in, in all of our minds, we should not be thinking this is like going back to the way it was, you know, two years ago where the chambers could be packed because I don't think anybody thinks that's a good idea for at least the foreseeable future. So, um, you know, there's the two sides of it, and, then it, and it appear, does appear as though the side for the council function is, you know, kind of set up. We obviously want to do some testing with you on, on that to make sure, but then there's the public expectation side of it, which I don't think we've done much in the way of communications about, but obviously that's a companion piece that has to work successfully, not to create even more acrimony. I I, um, I wonder if maybe the maker of the motion would be open to making it so that it's not based on a timeline that feels rushed, but based on a timeline that makes sure that we have these safety standards and all of this thought through um, prior to going into this model. Because I, you know, I think we all share a commitment to not inadvertently expose somebody to COVID or have a negative health impact by rushing something that isn't necessarily ready. So for me, I would feel more comfortable to have it kind of on a timeline that feels more aligned with um, just all the different checkpoints we want to have in place for safety standards than to have it rushed in 30 days. I don't know if that means modifying the motion language, but that would be more comfortable for me. 
Uh, is that a friendly amendment? Offer for a friendly amendment? Or? That is an offer for a friendly amendment. Mm, the maker of the motion? I just want to ask the um, the interim city manager, I guess because technically the way the motion stands, there's there's no timeline that was outlined, okay. was put forward. And part of that was to, you know, provide staff with the flexibility to work towards, you know, moving to the hybrid meeting, but ex explicitly, ex you know, expressed to the community that we, that our desire to move to hybrid meetings. And so I, I guess, you know, with respect to, since this was brought up by the assistant city manager, you know, what timeline we're thinking about, I guess, what would be a realistic timeline? And I also want to put out there that, you know, if, if I think that it's important that the community understands too, that if we find ourselves in a position where conditions are not safe, that we, you know, are able to move back to this um, hybrid um, structure as well. So I would like to ask uh, for your forbearance and um, having us, let's have a couple of weeks where the staff can work together. And then part of the city manager report on the 26th, I will kind of give you a roadmap to when this could happen. And so and with in mind and with the conversation we've heard here, um, we can sort of leave the motion, I think, the way it is. And um, we can come back at that point and give you a, sort of a, a trajectory of and where we are. That sounds perfect. That sounds fine to me. Okay. Um, I've got uh, Council Member Contrary Johnson. I just want to remind folks we are starting to run a little bit late here. Council Member Contrary Johnson. Thank you. And I just first want to apologize that I keep getting kicked off because of my internet connectivity. Um, I'm hoping at the break I'll move to a different location. Um, it seems like most of my questions and concerns were uh, brought up and addressed, but I'm not sure if this was brought up. When we do move to in-person hybrid, um, can we consider um, protocols in terms of, you know, vaccine proof of vaccination or rapid testing or taking temperatures. I know that some of the commissions and committees I'm on um, have started to look at that. And, and those are some of the things that they're asking for is proof of vaccination and rapid testing. So, um, and maybe you've already addressed this and I got knocked off and didn't hear it, but hoping we can consider those as well. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Uh, clerk, city clerk, um, Bonnie Bush, go ahead, please. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to address one little thing. We do have as part of the setup in chambers to prepare for um, eventual hybrid. We do have no touch thermometers um, in, at both doors. So we have that. As far as the proof of vaccine, I'm assuming we'll still use the same guidelines that we do for city offices. Um, but that'll be a conversation that we have with staff moving forward too. Thank you, Bonnie. Council Member Cummings, did you have more? I just had one brief comment. I think it might be worth um, considering having an ordinance brought forward to deal with potential anti-vaxxer maskers who want to take their masks off in chambers and potentially expose people as well. I know that there's been a number of groups that have been running around Santa Cruz um, pulling their masks off and going into buildings and making people feel unsafe. And so just thought I'd put that out there as a, you know, something that we might want to potentially consider as well as we move back to hybrid meetings. Okay. Uh, we have a motion uh, by council member Cummings, seconded by council member Brown. Dad, could I ask that the motion be either reposted or restated because there's quite a bit of discussion between <laughs> the motion and the... I believe it's the same. So I, I would interpret this as directing that the council shift immediately to hybrid meetings. So if that's not the intent, can we get clarification on that? That the council uh, begin the transition to hybrid meetings and reconsider meeting options uh, every 30 days. And by the way, the statute re basically requires that uh, in order to continue to have meetings by teleconference, you have to make a finding every 30 days. Every 30 days. So, Is that it, Tony? Just add yeah, I, said, again I said later. transition, but shift is fine. Oh. Transition better. Okay. Okay. 
the maker of the motion and the seconder? Okay, Bonnie, why don't we do a roll call vote? Council members Watkins? Aye. Calentari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Boulder? Aye. Sorry, I'm, I was unmuted. Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and vote aye, but I do want to just for the record, again, just recognize the work of our staff. There is no intention by council members or our staff to keep people out of public meetings. Um, I think the motion largely is an acknowledgement of the resolution that was in the packet. And so um, I think it's really important to clarify that there was no plan to try to prevent going back in person. It was just uh, merely a process to make sure everyone was going to be as safe as possible. So I'll support it, but I do want that on the record. Thank you. That motion passes unanimously. Okay, we've gone on through our consent agenda, and we now will move to item number 16, which is the Santa Cruz Cannabis Equity Assessment. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from the City Council. We will then take public comment and turn to the Council for deliberation and action. Okay, I will turn this over to Allison Cameron and Rebecca Unit from the Economic Development Department. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council, as Rebecca Unit, Economic Development Manager for the City of Santa Cruz. Um, and I am here today with uh, Don Arledge and Dominic uh, Corva from Humboldt State University who are with this uh, cannabis equity assessment. So the um, item before you today is our draft cannabis equity assessment. Um, the city was awarded a grant from the state of California. Um, Governor's Office of uh, Business and Economic Development back in March 2020, and uh, our work was a bit delayed by the pandemic, but we're excited to be well underway now. Um, and so today we have a on our cannabis equity assessment, um, which was prepared uh, with the help of the California Center for Rural Policy at Humboldt State University. Um, and we've had a great team working on this, and I also want to give a huge shout out to Allison Cameron, who's our uh, economic development coordinator, who's been doing a lot of the day-to-day -day work on managing this grant for us um, and helping us keep on track with all this. Um, so we'll have a brief presentation for you all, and then um, we'll be able to answer any questions. Um, and so I will share my screen to get our presentation up and turn it over to Dawn and Dominic. Thank you. Thank you for having us. I'm Dawn Arledge. I'm the Executive Director for the California Center for Rural Policy at Humboldt State, and I'm here with Dr. Do Dominic Corva, who is our Cannabis Policy Specialist. Next slide. So the California Cannabis Equity Act um, is essentially aimed at reducing barriers to entry for regulated cannabis and supporting um, individuals who are adversely impacted by cannabis criminalization and poverty to support them in being able to um, enter the legal industry. Next slide. Um, as Rebecca mentioned, the city of Santa Cruz received type one grant funding that uh, supports jurisdictions in conducting equity assessments and then developing a local equity program. Once you've developed an equity assessment and an equity program, you're eligible to receive and apply for type two funding from the state, which will give the jurisdiction funding to direct two individuals who have been impacted by cannabis criminalization and help them enter the legal industry. We have done this for several other jurisdictions and we appreciate being able to work with the city on this. Next slide. This is a, a very brief overview of the report and the sections in the report. Um, 
talks about the background of the state's work around this equity, um, the equity analysis we conducted for the city, current conditions in the city. We looked at um, current licenses and applicants, uh, barriers to entry that people are facing, and then we make recommendations for the cannabis equity program. Next slide. I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Corva. Few slides. Thanks, Dominic. Thank you, Don, and thank you, council members, for having us here today. Um, just a little bit on the the outreach that we had. Um, we had 18 interviews and meetings uh, with current and former elected officials, historical figures, community members. Um, uh, local nonprofit stakeholders and a little bit of law enforcement as well. Uh, and in addition to that, I think that's going to be the next slide, secondary sources. Uh, so in particular, we were assisted by the fact that there's been a, a fantastic academic uh, book by um, Dr. Wendy Chapkis, uh, who's now at the University of, of uh, Southern Maine, um, sociologist and uh, was in fact uh, part of what was going on in the 1980s and uh, uh, next to the emergence of WHAM when it happened. And uh, uh, the book from 2008 was uh, very helpful um, in contextualizing this is not just about, you know, cannabis, but about Santa Cruz as a city and the communities that were acting in it. Uh, we also drew on substantial oral history uh, interviews uh, from Current Santa Cruz Arts Commissioner Christopher Carr, uh, we're very grateful to him for also uh, interviewing with us a couple of times, and, and Pat Malo and several others, um, but also it's, it, it, an incredible oral history re, uh, resource as well. Over 200 interviews, I, I listened to about 40, 40 hours, and some of them over and over again. So um, this helped out with our, our primary data as well. So the key takeaways from the assessments, um, Santa Cruz is historically known as a significant cannabis consuming hub of countercultural and progressive political activity since the 1970s. Um, it is a globally significant center for cannabis breeding and horticulture innovation. And we go over that in, uh, in the assessment as well. Um, the city's non commercial medical cannabis community has been adversely in the state's transition to a tightly regulated, commercially oriented adult use market. Um, the city has a strong history of progressive politics that is highly sensitive to equity considerations in all policies and supportive of com historically supportive of community and medical cannabis organizing. Next slide, please. Um, in addition to that, the medical cannabis communities, which, which may be struggling to, to transition, of course, um, our interviews with uh, public sector stakeholders consistently identified beach flats and lower ocean as uh, low-income neighborhoods that were disproportionately impacted by uh, the drug war beyond and including, it probably should say there, civilization. Um, one of the things we talk about in the assessment is the, the recognition that it, what happened in Santa Cruz happened in the rest of the state as well, that uh, early sort of community and medical cannabis folks um, uh, were supplemented by a migration of uh, more commercially oriented actors uh, as legalization approached the city was was conservative uh, about their licensing as a result uh, they wanted to keep it uh, keep it small and local is what I kept hearing and uh, uh, as a result um, there is room in the city uh, for equity conditioned expansion, that is expansion of licensing and permitting applicants in particular. Um, and it will be consistent with the city's health and all policies approach and increase uh, uh, cannabis revenue funds, uh, which then could also go uh, into Santa Cruz's um, very unique uh, progressive program to use cannabis funds for early childhood education. Next slide, please. And our summaries of the barriers to entry are pretty standard. Um, this, uh, I was going to hand back over to Dawn and then take uh, slide time. Great, thanks. So, um, 
These barriers to entry are common, like Dominic said, across jurisdictions. Um, financial barriers to so the high cost um, of being able to enter the legal regulated market. Um, all And all new businesses, of course, face financial requirements when entering a new market. And that's true for those um, trying to enter the cannabis industry as well. Um, for banking, the barrier to entry there is around um, limit limited access to banking for cannabis businesses, um, in part due to federal um, classifications of cannabis. And it forces many businesses to operate with cash only and exposes them to risks um, associated with needing to operate that way. Um, administrative and technical barriers, basically, you know, obtaining the necessary permits to operate legally um, are time consuming, they're resource intensive, and it requires a high technical knowledge and skill. And for some people, that is um, a significant barrier to entry. And then people who um, are wanting to learn how to run a business, how to manage um, employees, accounting, inventory controls, all of the things associated um, with running a business are um, barriers to entry that tend to favor well-reached and highly educated applicants who have a better chance of um, being able to navigate these barriers. Next slide talks about the Santa Cruz specific context and I'll let uh, Dominic, take that one. Yes, uh, so as kind of probably indicated in the, the takeaways, uh, its community and medical cannabis community w was not necessarily all that commercially oriented, uh, and in particular, uh, uh, WAM as a, as a nonprofit that really operated uh, um, with, with pretty small margins by contrast with a lot of more sort of commercially oriented actors. And so it's those high capital barriers to entry uh, and, and expertise in running a business, which you have to run in order to be able to be part of the legal landscape that are really, you know, uh, big challenges. And, and there's there's a lot of room to potentially help help those out. And, and the community of Beach Flat Slower Ocean, um, center of Santa Cruz's Latinx population, has uh, experienced pretty intense policing um, in a city that uh, progressively decriminalized uh, medical cannabis in particular earlier than, than, than most jurisdictions in California and, and is, has more in common with other inner cities and other, other urban areas. And so it's home to people uh, uh, and, and families that, you know, helped in drug crimes, they were impacted by living in, uh, you know, a, a state of criminalization with, with more intense, uh, disproportionately more intense in other areas. And of course, capital barriers to entry are, are, are very strong for, for those folks too. And I'll turn the next slide back over to Dawn. On everything we learned in the assessment, um, CCRP is making recommendations to the city for you to consider including in your local equity program, which will be the, the manual and document that follow your equity assessment and bring you full circle to being eligible for type two funding. Um, so we recommend that the program be aligned with your health and all policies program. Um, we suggest licensing, looking at equity um, applicants and licensees um, that facilitate medical product innovation, patient access, data gathering for patients and community service. We mentioned the beach flats and lower ocean neighborhoods um, and assisting stakeholders from those disproportionately impacted areas. Next slide. To create specific services and programs, you can use the equity funding to direct to applicants that that help them overcome those barriers to entry. And we'll have, we have a whole list of suggestions of those things, just didn't wanna put it all in the PowerPoint, but it's all in the report. 
Then in terms of determining eligibility equity program, we recommend you look at specific populations with the lens of who was most most impacted by cannabis criminalization and or poverty so that those individuals can get some help to navigate entry. Um, you can basically set it up so that individuals, if they meet five of the 10 criteria, they'll score higher on their application. And this is a list of some of the eligibility criteria that we have listed in the report that is given what we've already said. Um, next slide. Um, the city can consider expanding the adult use cannabis retail cap. Um, you can look at allowing cannabis lounges to be attached to retail locations. These are all things that the city can consider um, as they move toward an equity program. Um, and we have seen other jurisdictions explore cannabis event licenses that create business opportunities for residents, limited access to capital. Event licenses have lowest capital barrier to entry for all, all state licenses since they do not have to be attached to permanent real estate. And there's more detail about these things in the report. So a quick overview, next slide. Then we recommend tracking data. The state will require you to do so if you receive uh, type two funding that basically, you know, looks at who the equity program is helping. Um, you could collect data about your cannabis workforce and you can do some tracking um, to help show the state the city and residents that the program is helping people. Next slide. And then we recommend you think of your equity program as uh, and your manual as a living document. So it is your actual equity program. The city will have be able to update it as new information becomes available as trends change in the industry learn of uh, areas for course correction and um, anything you may learn so that you can change course um, and think of the equity assessment as setting the baseline for the city around the history as well as the current state and then move forward. Next slide. Really quick, um, just so you know what others are doing, um, in addition to the city of Santa Cruz, um, Trinity County, Sonoma County, and San Diego County are all also in type one, as is the city of Clear Lake and Lake County. Um, Humboldt County, Lake County, and Mendocino County have all progressed to type two, so they have received at least one round of type two funding. We have seen um, Humboldt's received more than $4 million in type two funding. Lake has received one round and more than a million, and Mendocino has received, um, I think, about $3 million. Um, in type two funding. Next slide. So reasons to have a cannabis program, it's funding to assist your equity stakeholders. As we've said, it can support small legacy cannabis farmers. It can support the legal cannabis market and basically an economic driver for the city. Um, it supports enforcement and moving people away from the from illicit operations to legal above ground regulated operations, and um, it helps to um, improve like trust in the 
regulatory system for these people who have been operating outside that system um, all this time. Next slide. So what's next for the city? And then I'm going to turn it back over, actually, over to Rebecca here. Rebecca. Great. Thank you both so much uh, for covering all of that. So um, what's next for the city? We are um, going to be continuing to evaluate our um, program commitment workload and obligations. Um, we are currently evaluating uh, whether or not to apply for the type two excuse me, type two grant funding um, in this round. The state just uh, opened the application period for that grant than expected. Typically, they've done it in the spring, um, and they have opened it this fall instead with a deadline of December 13th. Um, so we're evaluating our capacity there to be able to finish out the work that we need to do on this grant uh, before applying for that next round. Um, we, uh, as part of that, also uh, consider a local funding contribution for the local equity program. So the state does require or, you know, gives you points if you provide local funding uh, towards your local, local equity um, program. So looking at what is possible there. Um, we're also looking at building program logistics, uh, program policies, procedures, forms, handouts, all of the different um, of the local equity program that we need to have in place to be able to operate it. Um, and then continuing to partner with all of the community stakeholders and uh, different partners that we've worked on throughout this grant. Uh, program and creating this Canvas Equity Assessment. Um, and so that's our presentation for you and our staff recommendation uh, this afternoon is to adopt the City of Santa Cruz Canvas Equity Assessment. Um, and we will welcome any questions that you might have on this item. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thanks for a great presentation. Um, really interesting work, really, really interesting work. Um, I'll go ahead and see if council members have questions. I see council member Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you uh, for that uh, that great report. As I was reading through the the document, um, I, I just kept thinking, wow, this this is a very cool research <laughs> project to do. And I'm glad you got a chance. I'm glad, um, uh, Dominic, that you as you said that you got to enjoy some of those oral histories. We got the benefit of that synthesis and analysis. Uh, and so it was really fascinating to read. I'm, I'm glad that we're moving forward on this and appreciate all of your recommendations. Um, I guess the question that I have is um, related to the, the issue of, in the recommendations, increasing the cap and doing that um, through an equity program is something that I think is I mean, I certainly, I'm, I'm really excited about that because it's been something that has been a challenge for us um, to try to support the, um, the pioneers in our community, really, who are doing this um, not for wealth accumulation, but really to, to serve our community and to help sick people. Um, and so uh, I'm, I'm looking for the question I have is kind of in connection with that. Like, so if we raise the, so, so WAM, I'm specifically thinking of, you know, when we had, I mean, they aren't having the, the challenge that they have. I mean, I know they have a lot of challenges. I won't speak for them, but um, raising the cap in and of itself isn't going to get them where they need to be in order to be able to provide this service. So there's a whole lot of other supports. And I think some of that is available through this, um, moving forward in this direction, but I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that, um, because that's what I'm really interested in, you know, in us so moving forward. The, the logic about that is that the retail cap was about how many retail stores, basically, that you wanted to, to handle based upon a you know, per capita calculation. But like that calculation is a commercial calculation. It's, 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 it's like, well, we're going to serve a general population with five retail caps. And WAMP, uh, WAMP Phytotherapies, serves a niche population, is not oriented towards, you know, growth and, 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 and more and more revenue. And, and it's currently occupying one of those retail spaces that otherwise could be generating some tax revenue for the city. And so the logic here is that, like, is to think about this more like, but wham, and they're, they're struggling. What you could do is take that pressure off the city by by expanding that that retail cap for for one more for sort of the general use, 
and it would give them some some room to stretch without feeling kind of that pressure to to open before they can, really. And and it's, it has been a capital struggle. And the equity grant can also help them open. And so it's a it's a you know the the thought for cap by one really was well, what is the what is the re- retail cap based on? What does it do for the city? And I, I think you know generating tax revenue and, and serving a general population is, is the idea. But you have a special case, and they're already kind of occupying one of those. Uh, retail spots, and, and uh, this way it would, it would I think, uh, release some, some and uh, and some room to move. Thank you. I guess just the, the, sort of as follow up, um, and maybe it wasn't totally clear. Um, so right, yes, and um, in terms of the additional supports, though, I guess I'm um, trying to to. Well, I'm just really thinking about wham. That's what I think about when I think about this stuff. Um, you know, uh, the the supports, right? To, to I mean, if they're not, they don't behave, um, but yet they have all of these rules and these, you know, capital um, constraints. And that's not the role of the city to provide capital. But I guess I'm just trying to figure out how this program can provide. Well, it, it could help. It, it could help them by, uh, you know helping them pay for the ADA compliance that they've got to put on their historical building, right? Because it costs $90,000, right? And that's a, that's a barrier to enter. They found real estate. That's a big challenge. Uh, and and it, as a result, it's more expensive. And uh, an equity grant program could grant them money to help them pay for that, for example. Thank you. That example just really helped crystallize the possibilities. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Then Councilmember Cummings. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for the uh, report and presentation. Really thoughtful and helpful information. I am um, kind of going off of what Councilmember Brown had all kind of started in terms of the um, kind of the increase of the retail cap. I was wondering if you could speak to maybe your experience and other jurisdictions. If if jurisdictions do something like a market study to kind of get a sense of what is of that right amount with not oversaturation, but not sort of just arbitrarily choosing, you know, a cap amount. Like, so, you know what I mean? I think like, how, how do we compile data essentially to help us understand what that kind of could look like in our community? And would a market study be something that could work? Uh, yes, I think that's a, it, it's a good idea. I think you went off one per 15,000 residents before or something like that, which was, you know, kind of a rule of thumb kind of thing at the, at the beginning. Obviously Santa Cruz, is a place that I think is more widely, you know, I, I think the rate of cannabis consumption is higher. Adult cannabis consumption is higher in Santa Cruz. And uh, um, I think that, you know, maybe finding comparable cities sort of culturally, Berkeley, and see what their, um, you know, per capita uh, retail is. You could kind of look for, you know, sister cities, basically as part of your market research. So, you know, you can look at the averages for your region, for where you are, you know, uh, relationship with the county and so forth. But I, I think that there are, are several fruitful ways to revisit how many retail shops you had. And, and, and the recommendation for, for one more was really based on not having to do that and sticking with your one per 15,000. But I think it's also a good idea because you could possibly accommodate another equity, you know, retail spot if, if you, you know, studied the matter further. Great, thank you, I appreciate that. Councilmember Cummings? Thank you for your presentation and for all the work that you all have done for this uh, equity assessment. The one question I had, um, it, you know, it was, it came up in the presentation, I was referring back to the agenda report, but in item number seven, equity program eligibility factors should be focused on specific targeted population. I thought I saw in the presentation that it was like, there was a, um, um, one piece of this was that individuals who reside in the city for at least two years between 2008 and 2016, and I thought I saw in the presentation it was like 1970 and 2016, but maybe I was wrong. I'm wondering, just some clarification on that. I, yeah, Don, can you take that one? Because I'm, I'm not really sure what the what the difference was. I, I think I, the, the 1970 one to, to 2016 made that sound like I don't know about the 2008 to 2016. Yeah, I think it's a good good catch, Council Member Cummings. I think it's a disconnect between the 
the slide deck and the report. Um, and certainly this could be something the city weighs in on. The um, I would by the report, but we could we could take a look and clarify. The idea there is around um, criteria that prioritizes people that live in the community and have been in the community for a period of time. So we've had different years okay. in different jurisdictions. Um, and so that's, that's a good catch on your part, an error <laughs> that we made in the the slides not matching the report. I'll go back, we'll go back and figure that out. Okay, my question, my question related to that though is that um, I'm just curious, we're not adopting these criteria and item, like right now, these are just recommendations. And then at a future time, if we want to move forward with whether it's, you know, making one more license available um, or, um, you know, on-site consumption lounges, that's when we would kind of take these factors, these equity factors into effect. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. Okay. I just wanted it to be clear because I, I think that um, I, I would want to revisit that, the questions around, um, you know, residents for two years within a set time frame because I think that we should also be considering, like, if it was 2016, you know, what about those people who got convicted in the 80s or 90s who haven't yeah. been living in the community but are coming back? and you know, want to try to establish some kind of business and get their lives on track. So that was just where the, the thinking was coming for me around you know, setting these, these time frames. So I concur completely. And, and uh, I believe the 1970 to 2016 was what's in the report. That ends my questions and just you know, want to express my gratitude for all the work that you all did on this. So thanks. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to add also to that. So this is our cannabis equity assessment. So this is the research piece of it and providing the recommendations. And then we will be bringing back to you uh, in a couple months here, our local equity program, which will have more of the details worked out of what it look like and what our plan is um, and how we would actually operate that. So yeah, that's more to come. Um, more of those details will be forthcoming. Yeah, today's item is uh, a motion to approve the equity assessment report. So. Um, Council Member Golder? So I just have one comment that I do appreciate all the work and I'm in support of, um, of everything here. I just wanted to say that I think um, this use and, you know, connecting it with health and all policies for me is kind of hypocrisy. And I understand um, and support this, but that's one piece that's a little hard for me to swallow. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Kontar Johnson. Thank you. I, I had a comment. Didn't know if I should wait till after public comment, but I'll just make it here. Um, thank you for bringing the report and for all the work. It's it's really really quite fascinating and interesting to see the historical context and and where we've been and where we've come. Um, I, I did want to point out the section around youth substance use and how we have double the rates of regular cannabis use. Um, when we com were compared to the state of California numbers. Um, and I think that's something that we have to be really acutely aware of as we um, think about the recommendations and how we want to move forward with the recommendations. Now, having said that, I've worked really closely with some of the members in the cannabis community um, and some of the cannabis regulation work I've done with the county. And um, some of these members, I'll just call out Valerie Corral and Wham, um, have been real advocates for children and youth, worked really closely with county coalitions that uh, work to address substance use among youth and children. They've been very, very supportive of the Children's Fund, um, the, that's upcoming Measure A. Um, so, so I want to say it's, it's a, we have to be aware that, that the prevalence is an issue in our community and that there are members of the cannabis have worked and I hope will continue. I know will continue to work with us, but that's something that we have to keep at the forefront as we um, navigate how we want to move forward as a city and as a community. But thank you so much for all the work. Thanks. Great. Um, I'll go ahead and take this out to the um, public now. Um, so I'm looking at in our attendees. If you would like to speak to this item, please press star on your phone to raise your hand at this time. So this will be for item number 16, which is
is the Santa Cruz Cannabis Equity Assessment. Okay, I am not seeing anyone raising their hand, so I will bring it back to council for uh, looking for a motion on the item and any other comments from council at this time. Council Member Watkins. I'm happy to move um, approval of the Cannabis Equity Assessment Report. Okay. Council Member Cummings. Second. Okay. Any other comments or questions before we take the vote? Seeing any. Okay. Um, we have a motion to approve Cannabis Equity Assessment Report by Council Member Watkins, seconded by Council Member Cummings. And Bonnie, can we do a roll call vote, please? Councilmember Watkins? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Holder? Aye. Vice Mayor Brunner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. That uh, item passes unanimously. Okay, we'll move on to item number 17 which is an ordinance amending Santa Cruz Municipal Code provisions referring to previously repealed sections in Santa Cruz Municipal Code 1. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, this, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. I'll do our Deputy City Attorney, Stephanie Duck. Thank you and good afternoon, Mayor and City Council members. Um, we are recommending that City Council introduce for publication this ordinance that amends various provisions of the Santa Cruz Municipal Code um, that currently refer to repealed sections um, from Title I. Uh, so by way of a little bit of background, um, Santa Cruz Municipal Code chapters 1.8 10 and 1.12 were all repealed in the year 2000 and replaced by what we currently have as Title IV of the Municipal Code, uh, which includes our general um, code enforcement provision. Um, I believe there was some effort at the time to go ahead and go through and replace um, any reference to those repealed Title I sections with the new uh, Title IV. However, our office has noted that there are still various um, sections that still refer to the repealed sections from um, Title I. And so this ordinance is simply proposing non-substantive changes um, to replace any reference to um, Title I or Chapter I, whatever, to Title IV. So happy to answer any questions if you may have any, keeping it short and sweet, so, but please um, chime in if you have questions. Thank you. Is there any questions for Stephanie on this item? Okay. I am not. And? Let me take it out to the public. If you are if, if you are a member of the public today and you're interested in commenting on ordinance on the ordinance amending Santa Cruz Municipal Code provisions referring to previously repealed sections in Santa Cruz Municipal Code Title I, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand at this point. I am not seeing in the public, so I will bring this back to the council and I would look for a motion on this item. Council Member Golder and then Council Member Contari Johnson. I'm happy to move um, the item as it's written in the agenda. And Council Member Contari Johnson? I'll second. Okay, we have a motion on the table to uh, introduce for publication and ordinance amending various sections of the City of Santa Cruz Municipal Code to replace erroneous references to repeal Chapter 1.08 with current Title IV General Municipal Code Enforcement, correct other minor internal inconsistencies. That motion is by Council Member Holder, seconded by Council Member Contrary Johnson. And can we have a roll call vote, please? Council Member Watkins? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Holder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? 
Aye. And Mayor Myers. Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Okay, we've now um, come to the end of our general business um, and we will be uh, going into oral communications now. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if you want to comment during oral communications, now is the time to call in or on your screen. Oral communications. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not on today's listed agenda item. If you are interested in addressing the council, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. You will have two minutes to speak. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. We request that you clearly and slowly state your name before making your comment so that we can accurately capture it in the meeting minutes. However, it is not required to to um, provide your name. Please remember that this is a time for the council to hear from the public. We are not able to engage in dialogue with each member of the public, but when we're able, we will address the questions raised after oral communications have been completed. I'm looking in the uh, audience today. If you do want to speak for oral communications today, this will be for items not on the agenda. Please raise your star nine on your phone. I have not seen any hands being raised at this point in time. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, adjourn our city council meeting. We will be back at 4.30 this afternoon and we will um, be addressing agenda item number 18, which is the 831 Water Street project. So please uh, tune back in at 4.30, we'll be back then. Thank you everyone. Public just joining us. We are now at agenda item number 18, 831 Water Street, a public oversight meeting, compliance with the city's objective standards criteria and accompanying 
density bonus request for an affordable housing project pursuant to SB 35. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from the council. We will then break for web-based input, which can be accessed at cityofsantacruz.com slash forward slash 831 water. After web-based comments are received, we will proceed with public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. Please note, public comment will not exceed 90 minutes, 45 minutes for the web-based public input and 45 minutes for those call. In order to hear from as many members of the public as possible, the time will be limited to one minute per person. I will now turn this over to our staff for their presentation. Thank you, Mayor Myers, and good evening to you and to the rest of the council. I'm Lee Butler, I'm Deputy City Manager and Director of Planning and Community Development for the city. And I'm gonna give a brief introduction to the item. Back on September 7th, we gave an update on SB 35 to the council. And as part of that, I introduced some of the background information related to the decades long housing production shortfall that was occurring throughout the state that was spurring a whole day of state legislation, particularly in the last four years that facilitates housing production. It was no different this year when the governor in the last month has signed 31 different housing related bills and we'll be back to you before the end of the year talking with you about those. Um, but tonight we're gonna focus um, primarily on um, 35 and the first application that we have received that is seeking to take advantage of SB 35, which provides a streamlined ministerial approval process. And SB 35 places significant limitations on the city's review of projects. Moment, I'll invite our city attorney, Tony Condotti up to speak to that. Um, we'll also highlight um, some of the provisions of the Housing Accountability Act and um, provisions of state density bonus law that apply to this project. But before doing so, I wanted to just point out that um, our city team has done an extensive review of the application that came in, including the materials that were submitted late last week. And based on that review, we have found the project to be consistent with objective standards. And we found the project is eligible for SB 35 streamlining. And we found that it is eligible for the density bonus requests that have been made. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to our city attorney, Tony Condotti, and then um, he'll be followed by Ryan Bain, our senior planner, and, and Wynn, our transportation planner, and they'll be providing more details on the specifics of the application review. Yes, thank you, uh, Mayor Myers, members of the city council, and thank you, Lee. Um, I've been asked to speak to the limits of the scope of review that the council is uh, operating under. Uh, under SB 35 and the density bonus law. <clears throat> so SB 35 allows the city to conduct a design review or a, or a public oversight meeting of this project as part of an objective standards review process. However, um, the process under the statute must remain ministerial. The role of the council is to focus on compliance with objective standards that are set forth in your uh, subdivision code and design review regulations. Um, the city council is required to assess compliance with these objective standards, um, to listen to public testimony and to provide direction to the applicant as to the project uh, eligibility for SB 35 streamlined uh, permit processing, uh, which includes the granting of a density bonus request. So, Ariel, what we mean uh, is, and as defined by SB 35, uh, a ministerial process is a process for development approval that involves little or no personal judgment by the public official as to the wisdom or manner of carrying out the project. Um, the official merely ensures that the proposed development meets all of the objective zoning standards, objective subdivision standards, and a 
objective design review standards in effect at the time the application is submitted, um, but uses no special discretion or judgment in reaching a decision. Um, prior to recent changes to the Housing Accountability Act and the enactment of SB 35, city staff and hearing bodies regularly considered such issues as neighborhood compatibility, scale, massing, potential nuisance factors, uh, the size or housing type proposed, and weighed those against policies that are adopted as sort of general goals, but are not always fully supported by uh, objective regulations. Uh, by contrast, the building permit process is an example of ministerial review and, and no public process is associated with building permit review because objective requirements for the public or a hearing body are considered um, as objective requirements are definitive. So in the building permit process, staff merely looks at objective standards and approves the permit if the application is consistent with all applicable requirements. Um, the statutory scheme is pursuant to SB 35 uh, requires the city to process an SB 35 application similar to a building permit, meaning that there is no discretion in the decision. And the city is merely tasked with finding whether the development complies with definitive requirements. Um, therefore, the public oversight process in this context is not the same as a public hearing, which in the past provided for council members to hear the concerns of the public and address those concerns by including conditions of approval or requiring changes or even denying a project based on potentially subjective city standards uh, or policies. The council's role in this SB 35 process will be to review the objective standards assessment table that is provided uh, packet to assess compliance with identified objective criteria and to provide direction to staff as to the project's eligibility for permit streamlining uh, under SB 35. Now, with respect to the density bonus for projects that include the requisite number of affordable housing units uh, and upon the request of an applicant, uh, uh, cities are generally required to allow more market rate units to be built than is otherwise allowed by applicable zoning um, and are provide and are required to provide incentives or concessions such as reduced development standards that result in actual and identifiable costs for the project uh, and to provide waivers or modifications of development standards that would physically preclude the project from being constructed as proposed uh, and also to allow reduced parking requirements. Um, Cities, again, have very limited discretion when reviewing density bonus applications and are generally obligated to grant a density bonus and incentives, conditions, waivers, or reductions in development standards to the developer, so long as the proposed development complies with the applicable affordability requirements and the waivers uh, or incentives or con uh, concessions meet certain standards. Uh, projects that include a specified amount of affordable housing are entitled to a density bonus, even if the density bonus would allow the project to exceed the maximum density under the city's general plan and zoning code. Um, and then generally the density bonus law requires the granting of these concessions and waivers unless the city can make certain findings uh, that are based on substantial evidence in the record. So for concessions or incentives, uh, the city would need to find that the concession or incentive does not result in identifiable and actual cost redu reductions. The key here is that um, there must be substantial evidence in the record uh, that those cost reductions uh, or that those concessions or incentives would not result in identifiable and actual cost reductions. Uh, and then with respect to concessions, incentives, and waivers, the city would uh, need to be able to find that the project would have specific adverse impacts upon public health and safety, uh, not only specific adverse impacts upon public health and safety, but uh, for which there is no feasible method to satisfy or avoid the specific adverse impact without rendering the development unaffordable. 
uh, under the uh, to low income and moderate income households. Um, with respect to specific adverse impacts, and and I would just note that there have been a lot of correspondence in your packet that refer to health and safety impacts of the project, but the but the density bonus law um, to those specific adverse impacts uh, incorporates the definition that is contained in the Housing Accountability Act, and it defines specific adverse impact to mean a significant, quantifiable, direct, and unavoidable impact based on objective, identified, written public health or safety standards, policies, or conditions existed on the date the application was deemed complete. So just a general notion of a uh, potential public health and safety impact uh, is not adequate uh, under the density bonus law as the basis for denying uh, a consent is, or a concession uh, incentive or waiver. And then lastly, um, under the Housing Accountability Act, the applicant or a person who would be eligible for uh, eligible to apply for residency in the project or a housing organization um, may bring an action to enforce this section. And if in the action the court finds that the city disapproved a housing development project that complied with applicable objective general plan and zoning standards and criteria or imposed conditions that uh, the project be developed at a lower density without making adequate findings concerning health and safety um, and public health or safety standards, then the court is required to issue an order or judgment uh, compelling compliance within 60 days and is also required to award reasonable attorney fees and costs of suit to the uh, plaintiff or petitioner. That concludes my remarks. I'm happy to answer any questions or respond to comments. Lee, did you have another another part of your team, transportation planner? Yes. At this point, Ryan Bain will speak to some of the project specifics. And it looks okay. like he's sharing his screen now. And then Nathan Wynn will also chime in as part of that presentation. And then if council is amenable, um, take questions after we get the, the presentations, if that's okay with folks. Okay, it's a lot to take in, I know. <laughs> but. And Ryan, we've got your notes pages showing. So if you wanna switch the screens that you're using. Okay, hold on one second, all right. Bear with me just one second. Are you able to see that or? No, we don't. Yeah, we don't see anything yet, Ryan. Sorry about that. No worries. All right. So, I have my presentation open. I'm trying to share. Does Bonnie have a copy of it? She does. I do. I, I can yeah. I can share my screen if you want, Ryan. Okay. Thanks, Bonnie. Sorry about that. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. So yeah, um, this is Senior Planner uh, Ryan Bain. Um, good afternoon, and um, 
I know that uh, this is a public oversight meeting um, for the 831 water project. And um, I'll start out with a little bit of five. I know that uh, this was covered pretty in-depthly at the September 7th study session meeting. Uh, and then also uh, Tony also covered it as well. But I'll just kind of give a brief um, overview in terms of um, for those who weren't able to attend the study session meeting, uh, and just get a little background. So, um, let's see, uh, I guess, Bonnie, I'll have to ask for the next uh, slide. Okay. So, um, the state legislature passed SB 35 in 2017 uh, as part of a 15 bill package to address the state's housing shortage and high cost of housing. Um, SB 35 is designed to remove barriers to the development of affordable residential urban infill projects and to limit certain types of discretionary um, home rule oversight that has prevented the development of an adequate supply of housing within the state. 35 requirements apply to the city of Santa Cruz and other urban areas of the state that have failed to make adequate progress toward their regional housing needs allocations as determined by the California Department of Housing and Community Development. So at this time, the city is currently short by 123 uh, very low-income units, but has exceeded all the other categories. So, so with, the current, with the city currently being short, those very low-income units, we must accept applications for SB 35 uh, and process them in a manner consistent with the state legislation. Thank you. When a short project qualifies um, for streamlined ministerial approval under SB 35, the city uh, has a limited time to apply for objective, to apply its objective standards to the project and is strictly prohibited from applying any discretionary standards or from taking actions or implementing any process that um, chill, inhibit, or preclude development of affordable housing on a suitable site identified in this general plan. So as part of the review for this SB 35 project, uh, the Planning and Community Development Department coordinated with the other uh, city departments to produce a table of objective standards based on the city's municipal code, adopted policies, directives, and plans. And that's included as, as part of your uh, staff report. So if there are areas where the project is inconsistent with objective standards, the city must provide a written documentation letter to the applicant listing each conflicting objective standard and provide a description of how the project uh, is in conflict. Uh, if the city does it fails to provide this written documentation within the limited time frame, the project is deemed qualified for streamlining ministerial processing under SB 35. And uh, under the current timeline, uh, the city now has until October 14th or 13th uh, to provide the applicant with written documentation. Next slide. So in terms of the city council's role, um, as mentioned, so six, section 65913.4D1 of the California Co Government Code allows jurisdictions to complete a design review or public oversight meeting of the development as part of the SB 35 objective standards review process. However, the process remain ministerial. So the role of the City Council for this project is to focus on compliance with the objective standards, and, and that's mainly it. So the Council's role in this process will be to review the objective standards assessment table that's provided, um, assess compliance with the identified objective criteria, and provide direction to staff as to the ability for permit streamlining pursuant to granting of the density bonus and compliance um, with the objective, objective standards. Next slide. So in, in terms of objective standards, I think you guys have probably heard this quite a bit, um, but the HCD provides um, the following definition and description of objective versus subjective standards. So it means standards that involve no personal or subjective judgment by a public official and are uniformly available by reference to an external and uniform benchmark or criterion available and knowable by both the applicant or development proponent and the public official prior to submittal and includes only such standards as are published and adopted by ordinance or resolution by a local jurisdiction before submission of a development application. Um, it should also be noted that there's been recent cases, uh, even just in the last month or so, involving City of San Mateo that have narrowed down what objective standards are. Um, in that ruling, a standard that cannot be applied, it's a, it's a standard that cannot be applied without personal interpretation or subjective judgment is not objective under the Housing Accountability Act. 
So just to give a little background for this particular SB 30, um, on October 12th of last year, uh, pre-application was submitted and reviewed by our staff um, for this particular application. Um, there was a community meeting, meeting held in January of this year um, that was well attended. And um, on June 3rd, the applicant submitted a notice of intent to submit the SB 35 application and then formally submitted in July, on July 1st. Um, we started the review and uh, there, there were revised plans submitted July 27th that extended our review time. Um, and then on August 12th, um, we did have a community meeting that again was well attended. And then on September 9th, or I should say on September, we scheduled an oversight meeting for the council on September 14th. And just prior uh, to that meeting, um, the revised plans um, and requested that that be continued so we could have some time to review those plans um, and reschedule it for today's meeting. Um, the, let's see, then last week on Friday, we, re we received revised plans after this meeting staff report had already gone out and staff did a review um, and provided a supplemental staff report yesterday and uh, that's kind of, that's where we are up to this point. And the next, thank you. So in terms of the site location, uh, the site is currently made up of three parcels that total are almost 40,000 square feet, a little under an acre on the Northwest corner of Water Street and North Branson 40 Avenue. The parcel currently contains a one-story building and a separate drive-in car wash, which are proposed to be demolished as part of this application. Um, commercial and residential uses surround the project site. Uh, it's bounded by single family homes, both to the north and west, with commercial and public facilities across Water Street and North Bronx Authority to the south and east. Uh, the Water Street corridor consists of mainly commercial retail uses, with uh, North Bronx Authority mostly consisting of single family and multifamily uh, residential. Uh, the site's fairly level. Um, and is at grade with North Branch of 40 with the bordering Water Street uh, dropping away as it heads west along the southern property line toward Ocean Street. Um, the site is, is fully paved with the exception of some small landscape strips um, along the western and northern property lines and gains its access currently from along North Branch of 40 and Water Street. In addition, um, a fire access easement currently exists across the site to provide fire emergency access to the end of Belvedere Terrace, which dead ends at the western uh, portion of the site. So the proposed uh, mixed-use project consists of two separate multi-store buildings um, over a shared underground parking garage that is proposed to be accessed from Water Street. Uh, one additional access is from North Branch of Forte, uh, which serves as both a fire access lane to the north of the building, as well as a driveway for access to seven at-grade commercial parking spaces and the uh, proposed traffic enclosure. The, the existing fire access um, for Belvedere Terrace is proposed to be reoriented along the southern edge of the property, which you can see uh, parallels uh, Water Street. Um, for Building A, um, which is the eastern building, it's proposed at five stories in height um, with 2,086 square feet of ground floor retail that's facing North Branch of 40 and Water Street, as well as five live work um, units that are facing Water Street and a mix of 64 units consisting of studios, one bedrooms, two bedrooms, and three bedroom units. For building B, um, that's the Western building, it's proposed at four stories in height uh, with a community room, office, laundry, and lobby on the first floor. It would contain 71 units consisting of studios, one bedrooms, and two bedrooms. So the proposed 140 resi residential units include uh, five live work, 64 studios, 53 one bedroom, 15 two bedroom, and three three bedroom units. So the zoning for the parcel is CC, community commercial. Um, the purpose of the CC districts, as it states in our zoning code, is to provide locations throughout the community for a variety of service uses for residents of the city and the region, which promotes policies of the general plan. 
to encourage a harmonious mixture of a wide variety of commercial and residential activities, including limiting limited industrial uses if they are compatible and nuisance-free. So the CC zone district normally allows for mixed-use developments consisting of ground floor commercial and multiple dwellings with the approval of a special use permit, which would not be required um, under this SB 35 application. In terms of the CC development standards, um, the project meets all of the zone district, zone district standards with the exception of height and private and common open space. And with the request for a density bonus, the applicant is proposing, proposing two concessions and four waivers to the development standards, which will be discussed a little bit later. Uh, the city zoning ordinance would require a total of 192 parking spaces on site based on the number and type of units. Um, this includes guest parking and commercial retail. Um, based on density bonus law, which um, allows for a reduction in, in parking, the standards are lower and require a total of 107 spaces on the site. Um, however, SB 35 prohibits jurisdictions from applying parking requirements to projects that are located within a, within a half mile of public transit for which this project complies. So they are not required to provide any parking on site. But uh, with that being said, the applicants are proposing an underground garage, as can be seen here, which will provide 136 spaces. So uh, including the seven spaces at grade level, a total of 143 parking spaces are proposed on the site. Um, the upper levels uh, are, are going to be all residential units with the majority of balconies facing Water Street and Branson 40 Avenue. So level two, level three, level four, and five are all going to be residential units. Bonnie, if you could go through to rooftop decks. Thank you. So um, rooftop decks are proposed uh, for both buildings, um, providing a shared common open space for residents. Um, the two decks share a bridge connection between the buildings and will be shared by residents of both buildings. The amenities uh, include community garden beds, uh, lounge seating, uh, putting green and outdoor kitchen facilities. So this is uh, um, all common, common open space for all residents for both buildings. Also, as part of the project, uh, so as I mentioned, the project is currently made up of three parcels. Um, so the application includes a lot line adjustment to reduce the number of lots from three um, to two um, with a proposed lot line splitting the two buildings so that they are on separate parcels. Um, there are a couple of different arrangements discussed for the lot line adjustment. So there's a couple of different options, um, but this is what's currently being proposed. Um, the intent of separating buildings is to separate the affordable units from the market units so that a, a deed restriction, um, which is required by the state's low income housing tax credit can be recorded on the parcel um, with the affordable units in order to receive state and local affordable housing grant funds and this separation is required by the, its financing re, uh, sources. So staff has reviewed the proposed lot line adjustment and it is consistent with the zoning ordinance. Um, also, the applicants have met with the city build, building official to discuss the new lot line as it relates to building and fire codes and have come up with a couple of lot orientation work with a shared underground garage and pedestrian bridge, bridge connections that connect the two buildings. Um, so as I mentioned, if revisions to the lot line adjustment are necessary, they can be reviewed at the building permit stage. Um, but the key point here is that these mapping changes require a few, few changes to the actual project plans, and one or more mapping options can be readily uh, accomplished. We've looked at a few different options. Um, in regards to public um, a southbound North Brand Supporty Avenue right turn lane has been included on the plans. Uh, this improvement is required to be implemented as part of the capital improvement program previously appro approved by the city council. Uh, public work staff has worked with the applicants to develop a conceptual plan for the right turn lane whereby the applicants grant a four foot sidewalk easement along a portion of the eastern property line to accommodate the right turn lane as well as an eight foot sidewalk. 
Um, so the eastern facing first floor retail wall has been recessed approximately four feet to accommodate for this sidewalk easement. Um, also, um, the project is proposing a new driveway along uh, Water Street, which accesses the underground parking garage. Uh, members of the community have expressed some concerns with the location of the driveway, and city staff has analyzed the site for alternative locations. Um, based on the initial analysis, staff has concluded that the proposed location is the best location for the driveway access, given the various factors associated with the site, such as shape and proximity to a signalized intersection. Uh, so the city has initiated a traffic study um, to address concerns surrounding the driveway location as it relates to the slope of the street, the bike lane, the bus stop, and site distance. Recommendations proposed as part of that traffic study that's being prepared will be included as a condition uh, will be included as conditions of approval for the project, uh, which could include such things as incorporation of vehicle warning devices at the driveway uh, to warn cyclists and pedestrians of vehicles exiting. Um, or potentially relocating the bus stop. So all of those things will be looked at as part of that traffic study. Um, additionally, new curb gutter and sidewalk are proposed along the front edge of the site. Um, in regards to density bonus, um, so as you're well aware, to address California's need for affordable housing, um, the state enacted the density bonus law back in 1979 to encourage the provision of affordable housing units by offering a a combination of benefits to developers. So for projects that include the requisite number of affordable housing units and upon the request of an applicant, cities are required to allow units to be built than otherwise allowed by the applicable zoning designations um, to provide incentives or concessions, such as reduced development standards that result in actual and identifiable cost savings for the project and also waivers or modifications of development standards that would physically preclude the project from being constructed, uh, as well as allowed reduced parking um, requirements. So cities have pretty limited discretion um, when reviewing density bonus applications and are generally obligated to grant them, um, and as well as the incentives, concessions, and waivers uh, to development standards. So projects that include a specified amount of affordable housing are entitled to density bonus, even if the density bonus would allow a project to exceed the maximum density. So to determine whether a project qualifies uh, for a density bonus, the percentage of affordable units is based on the maximum number of units that will be permitted under the city's zoning code. So this is the of the project. So in this particular case, it's 109 units. Um, in areas where there's no density range, um, the zoning ordinance requires an applicant to submit base plans uh, or plans showing a project that fully conforms to objective standards in order to determine the number of units that could be constructed on the site, thus establishing the base density of 109 units. So that's basically taking setbacks and height and everything and determining how many units could be um, included within those parameters. So the applicant has provided plans for a base project that meets all of those standards, uh, as I mentioned, including height, setbacks, open space, et cetera. Um, market rate projects providing certain percentages of affordable units or units at deeper levels of affordability are entitled to increase in density up to 50% uh, of that total number of units that are allowed under the city's uh, zoning ordinance or the base density. So the additional units basically help offset the increased costs associated with the increased number of uh, increased number of or more deeply affordable units. And by law, the percentages of affordable units that qualify a project for the density bonus are based on project only and not the base project plus the density bonus. So in this particular case, with a base density of 109 units, a minimum of 55 affordable units would be required to be provided for the project to be eligible for SB 35 streamlining. Um, the applicants are proposing 71 affordable units at 80% AMI or lower, which is well exceeding the density bonus requirements and qualifies for a 50% density bonus, um, which would also permit actually up to 164 units. Um, but the applicants are proposing 140 in this particular case, which falls within that allowed number. Um, additionally, the project meets all of the affordable housing requirements. 
um, including the 20% of base units at 80% AMI um, that's required by our city inclusionary. And in terms of the density bonus, um, there, are certain, there are various ways to meet the density bonus affordability requirements, um, but the final breakdown will really be largely based on the funding source requirements. So um, those will be required to be met and then written into the affordable housing agreement once that's determined. So as, as we discussed, there's concessions and waivers. Um, in this particular case, um, there are two concessions that are being um, proposed. Um, and at, based on, actually, I should, I should mention that the project is entitled up to three concessions um, based on, on the identical, based on what they're proposing. So they're proposing two, um, one to locate all affordable units in a single building and, and the other to not provide the required number of electric vehicle charging stations on site. So uh, the city zoning code requires that uh, inclusionary units shall be dispersed throughout the residential development to prevent the creation of a concentration of affordable units within development. So the applicant is requesting an incentive um, for locating all the affordable units together in a single building due to financing requirements for state affordable housing tax credits. Um, the California Code of Regulations requires projects that receive state and federal affordable housing funds record a regulatory agreement against the property awarded the tax credits. So the affordable rental project cannot be deed restricted unless at least one part did for all of the affordable units against which the regulatory agreement can be recorded. So evenly dispersing units throughout the two buildings would render the projects ineligible for one of its major sources of funding. And without these tax credits, the project would be unable to obtain financing sufficient to allow the project uh, to move forward. Uh, for concession two, um, the zoning code specifies that there's to be 12% of the provided parking uh, as electric vehicle charging stations. So based on 143 spaces provided on state, uh, 18 spaces would be required. The project is proposing six. So the applicant has requested a concession and incentive to reduce the number of, of uh, EV stations by 12. So given that there's really no evidence that these concessions and incentives would violate state or federal law or create a specific adverse impact on health and safety or the physical environment that cannot be mitigated or adversely impact um, real property on the California Register of Historical Resources, the city is required to grant these concessions and incentives as required by state law. So for waivers, um, the project is allowed to re request as many waivers from development standards as development standards would preclude the density bonus project from being built at the allowed density. So the applicant has requested four waivers um, of development standards, all of which are required to be waived if they preclude project development. Um, the city must grant these waivers uh, unless they violate state or federal law or create a specific adverse impact on health and safety um, or uh, adversely affect a, a listing California Register of Historical Resources. So um, there's no evidence of that these waivers that are being requested would um, should not be granted as required by state law. Um, so going through the waivers, <clears throat> the first one is project proposals that exceed the height um, ex exceed the maximum height of three stories and 40 feet as a uh, CC zone district. Um, they're proposing a four-story building at approximately 48 feet and a five-story building at approximately 59 feet. So complying with the three-story and 40-foot standard would require the building to reduce the number of floors and eliminate a substantial number of residential units. So this would physically preclude the construction of the project um, that would include the number of residential units allowed under the state density bonus law. The second waiver is a reduction of private open space. Um, so the project proposes that reduction. Um, the zoning code normally requires 100 square feet of private open space for each unit. So with 140 units, that's 14,000 square feet of private open space that's required. And the applicant is proposing 6,510. So um, set, based on setbacks and easement areas, which 
prohibit this, the encroachment of balconies and limit the amount of space uh, for providing private open space for each unit. Um, the constrained site physically precludes the inclusion of the required open space, which would require reducing the size and or number of the residential units. Um, similarly, waiver three is a reduction of common open space. Um, our zoning code requires 150 square feet of common open space for each unit. So with 140 units, um, that would require 21,000 square feet of common open space, providing, providing 19,830, which is actually very close to the requirement. Um, so common open space has been maximized on the site by taking advantage of the roof decks and at grade areas. Um, and as I mentioned, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty close to meeting that requirement, just under. Um, waiver four uh, is the project proposes to exceed the maximum 1.75 FAR uh, as outlined in, so with a 2.28 FAR, the project proposes an FAR in excess of the allowable maximum prescribed in the general plan, um, but obviously reducing the floor area to meet the 1.75 would require reducing the unit count and physically preclude the number of residential units that are allowed under the state density bonus. So, as described um, in the supplemental staff report, the applicant submitted revised plans that have addressed the remaining minor items that were uh, identified in the original council report, and staff has determined that the project is consistent with all objective standards. So, therefore, staff is recommending that the city council review those objective standards tab the table and find the project consistent with the standards necessary for granting of the density bonus and with all objective standards. And uh, I'm available for any questions. Okay. Thank you, Ryan. Um, are we not, we're not gonna do, uh, hear from uh, Nathan uh, Lee or are we? Uh, Nathan, hey, I think I'm available. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, Ryan covered Nathan's slides, and Nathan okay. did say he's available if there are questions. Okay, yeah. but I, I, it looked like that maybe is, yeah, great. Okay, but Nathan, you're here for questions. Okay, I'll uh, bring this back to council for questions and uh, look for uh, any hands raised. Um, just for the public, I'm gonna go ahead and have council uh, make any questions that they'd like to the, to the staff just for, um, you know, clarification on the presentation that was just done, and then uh, I will bring it out to public comment. Uh, and I believe we're gonna do our 45 minute um, virtual comment process first, and then we'll do um, our regular in-person oral comments, and then we'll bring it back to council for deliberation after those. Uh, and I do have three groups that are have requested, um, requested extra time today, and I'll, uh, Cue you up for that. Um, okay, so I've got, um, let's see, I've got Councilmember Watkins, Councilmember Brown, Councilmember Golder, and then uh, Councilmember Contour Johnson in that order. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Ryan, for the presentation. It's a lot to wrap your head around. There's a lot of really, lots of moving parts and um, obviously areas where we're all learning. I guess my question is in regards to the two parcels um, and how we're able to allow for him to have two parcels and then have it be approved as one project, but yet sort of set up for potential uh, separate kind of units, I guess, for future sale. I mean, I, I'm trying to understand how that all fits together personally. Ryan, Ryan, you want to take that, or I, I can take it. I mean, we, um, you know, we approve projects with multiple parcels regularly. Uh, it happens um, both in commercial and residential developments. You know, if you look at, for example, um, uh, you know, projects, any project that involves a subdivision that has a tentative map comes to the council, and sometimes that's done as condominium units. Oftentimes, in these larger projects, you'll see that condominium units, um, but we'll also see the um, the provision of um, individual um, parcels as well, as you saw with, say, um, the Eret Circle project. 
um, with individual units on individual subdivisions. Um, this one, um, we're looking at a number of approaches um, to how that subdivision could occur, um, whether that is um, through, if, if there's a, um, a vertical lot line that bypasses, as, as Ryan said, that's their first um, choice there. And that could involve some, uh, uh, some uh, building code requirements at um, the building code stage, so, so or the building permit stage, so they would have to meet those. Or they could involve actually um, horizontal and vertical property lines, uh, or it could be condominiums. I think the the key point there is that there are multiple ways in which that can be done. The applicant has a preference for how that can be done, but there are multiple ways in which it can be done, and it it is. Um, you know, when, when we've got um, a tentative map um, involved, it typically goes to the council. Here, um, because it's associated with SB 35, it is that um, ministerial review. So um, I think I caught most of that, but I, I, one of the kind of questions I think more for the layperson is if they're using sort of this SB 35 to have these two parcels work off each other to increase kind of all of the different concessions associated with SB 35 and the density bonus, but yet in the future, could they sell them separately? I mean, they could split off the two parts, correct, and then sell them individually. Is that accurate or not? So if they're two parcels, they could um, sell them individually. Um, I um, understand that, they, that one of the reasons why they're trying to do that is because they're actually looking to finance them separately with one of them as a 100% affordable project that some of the, um, the um, requested um, grant applications require a, a separate parcel. Um, so that's why they're looking at doing those. One of them would be you know, more traditional financing um, and then the 100% affordable would um, have some of those grants that would, also, that would um, contribute to the financing. Question in regards to the um, really segregated housing proposal, essentially, which is sort of essentially saying you're going to put all people who are going to qualify for affordable in one building and those in market rate in the other, which I personally find offensive, but um, that I guess doesn't really apply to this context. Nonetheless, it seems that could have a negative public health impact on the residents of the affordable unit on that parcel. Um, has that been considered as one question? And then two, has that ever happened in previous um, housing developments where you allow a developer to essentially sort of segregate the affordable units from the market rate um, so blatantly? So a um, couple things. First off, with the public health and safety impact, it has to be a written, quantified, um, and um, uh, so measurable um, impact that's been um, identified when the application was submitted. We don't have such a, um, a such a written impact. That said, I, I recognize that concern, and in fact, our, our ordinance calls for the units to be evenly distributed, and that's why, as part of their um, density bonus request, they have included the um, concession or um, incentive to um, be that they are not um, distributed evenly throughout the project. And with a um, with an application that um, would require the, the financing applications, it would require those in those units to be on an individual parcel so that it can be financed separately. And there are other reasons for that as well that uh, others can can supplement if you guys want to go more into the weeds about that in terms of um, the long term maintenance and such. But but essentially having those fine, if there is a, a downturn and the the market rate portion actually you know defaults, then the 100 percent affordable portion would not be affected. And so there are some benefits um, in that respect as well. And um, so, so while there are those concerns about um, 
you know, sort of a segregated population. Um, there are um, there are reasons for doing it in this instance, and they have gone through the right process by utilizing one of the available um, concessions or incentives for that. And um, I'll just note that um, we, we did receive some correspondence related to this earlier today, and um, one of the things that was pointed out um, was in the um, HCD's guidelines, they actually, for, the, for SB 35, the HCD's guidelines for SB 35, they actually point out that the units should be integrated and distributed as well, unless it's otherwise necessary for state or local funding programs. And so it specifically recognizes that in certain instances that needs to be the case. And I think your final question was whether or not that's been done elsewhere. We've allowed that, and, and actually our, our ordinance does actually allow for that in some respects when it allows for things like dedication of land. So in lieu of providing our, the inclusionary units on site and integrating them, that you can have dedication of proper. Um, you know, I think, I think that. I'm, I'm familiar with that. I, I'm familiar with that in terms of the dedication, but not on the same sort of housing project parcel I, as, as far as I can recollect. But my, um, I guess I thought one follow-up question to um, one of the points that you made was um, in order for it to qualify for some of the housing, but if there were modifications to the plan, could they still qualify to receive some of the affordable housing benefits? I mean, do they have to have two bedrooms, one bedroom? I mean, like how could they tinker with that in terms of how they design it that wouldn't necessarily put it in the category where they can do this or, 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 or we're, we're now you know presented with having to do this? Um, a couple of things. Um, one, I do want to go back to your last question just briefly because I will say that there are some questions out there and in response to some of those. Um, I don't see that there's an issue with us conditioning the project such that the units will be distributed, the affordable units will be distributed unless a funding source um, uh, dictates that they need to be consolidated. So I just wanted to go back to um, for a second. And then with respect to the one bedrooms versus two bedrooms or multiple units, there are some um, funding sources. Jessica DeWitt or others can speak to that in more detail if you want to get into the weeds about it. There are some funding sources, and in fact, we've modified, for example, our um, uh, Pacific Station South project to include um, greater numbers of two and three bedroom units so that we call those funding sources. But um, we don't um, have an ability to mandate that there you know, uh, you know, have to include multiple bedrooms. I, I think that, um, that some of the funding sources might dictate that um, for them. Um, and I think you said if there are changes down the road, what could happen? Um, SB 35 allows for a certain percentage of changes to occur and still have the um, project proceeds. So at the building permit stage, if they, for example, um, achieve some funding, but they needed to have more two bedroom units, they could continue with the project. So as long as it did not exceed those thresholds, assuming you know everything moves forward um, uh, with the SB 35 eligibility um, and the project approvals this evening. I'm going to let my colleagues ask their questions. I just have one last question in regards to what I think I saw in the presentation with the driveway on Water Street, and that's going to be like studied. Um, I don't know if anybody has a street on your bike, but even the picture <laughs> looked like there was a car coming out and a biker coming at the same time in the image on the on the on the PowerPoint. Um, I have real hesitation around potentially having a driveway coming out in the middle of that steep hill when people were riding their bikes down, even if you do have like a noise machine. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Or is that, I mean, I'm assuming the area and seeing people biking really fast down the hill. Um, yeah, yeah, I've biked down that many times as well. And um, I will, um, I'll say a couple of things and then I'll turn it over to our transportation engineer who I, I'm sure can speak to you on a much more technical level. But again, it, one of the things that it gets back to is those uh, quantifiable objective standards. Um, and um, uh, then um, with respect to the locations, you know, when we talk about the locations of driveways, we really want to make sure, and you know, Nathan will speak to this, I'm sure, but 
Um, you know, in, in all my experience, the traffic engineers typically want to move them as far away from the intersections as possible. And that's one of the things that this project has done is it does have them look as far away as possible on the, um, on the parcel. So, you know, there are limitations with respect to um, the parcel dimensions, but they have been located um, uh, far from that intersection to minimize conflicts right there at the intersection. And Nathan, I'm sure, can speak to that much more eloquently than I can. Yeah, hi, uh, Nathan Wynn, Transportation Manager, City of Santa Cruz. So uh, the site is a challenging site for us in, in evaluating the driveway locations. Uh, when the project first was submitted, we definitely had uh, concerns with the driveway locations, both on Water Street and, and on Ramps 40. And um, so part of the project, you know, the developer wasn't required to submit a, a traffic study because we didn't have an objective standard stating such that it was going to be required for this type of development. So um, we've taken it upon ourselves to hire consultant Kimley Horn initial evaluation of those driveway locations. I don't have the, the traffic study yet, but based on our discussions with our consultant team there, uh, the driveway locations are, you know, for, for better or worse, located in, you know, in the most optimal locations, just given the uh, constraints of the, uh, again, the site. They are going to do a site distance evaluation, and from what I can tell, that it looks like it's probably going to meet the, the site distance evaluation. Um, in addition to that, though, we are going to be looking at proposing mitigation measures to help, uh, you know, improve, um, uh, again, some site or, uh, or um, highlight basically cars coming out of that driveway. Um, that's yet to be determined, but those things will be uh, posed as conditions of approval during the uh, building permit phase. I think I'll leave my questions at, um, at there for now. Thank you. And next up, I have Council Member Brown. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you to uh, staff for the review of the project and the role of the council in this process. Um, it, I'm hearing a lot of feedback. Oh, I'm. I apologize. I'm going to walk away from. So I is that you hearing okay. the council meeting? Okay. And I couldn't figure out what it is. My neighbor is listening to it really loudly. <laughs> so here we're hearing it. Oh, that's it. too funny, Sandy. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Thank you, right, Council Member. I, I thought like, it wouldn't come through. <laughs> it sounded like Nathan again. I was like, Hello. yeah, it is. <laughs> okay. I'm hearing him. Uh, just in Thank case you. I missed something, my neighbor has it covered. Um, okay, so um, a question that I have, um, I have a couple um and I, I don't want to take up too much time because I recognize the public has been waiting for quite some time here. And um, they're, oh my gosh, you're, I can still hear it. Yeah. Do you have, you don't have your TV on or is something? No, I don't. It's my, I just don't have a very, um, here, let me try another spot. Sorry, I don't have very many um, quiet places and my windows aren't double paned here. I'm going to try this. Okay, can, is that, can you hear me now? My it's That's on. Better. That's okay. much better. Yeah, thank you, Sandy. I'm, I'm like hiding. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, um, the, um, I have a question about the, um, for, related to the density bonus. I know we're talking about objective standards primarily, but given that the application has um, included this, I just want to ask if I could if I could get some information about. Um, I didn't see in the official application documents the table that um, of affordable units um, and what percentage of AMI the, the rents for those units would be set on. And I know some of those are um, unknown because they're project-based vouchers. Um, but I don't see that table that's referenced. And I'm just wondering, did I miss that? Where is that? Um, so that's one question. I think um, that Mart I think Council Member Watkins' questions um, that answered a lot of my questions. I, I may have some follow up related to the the segregation of housing, but I'm going to wait on those. I'd like to let the public get their chance to speak. Um, but that's that one. Where's the table, and Where's how do we? Sure, I'll invite Ryan up for that one. Yeah, um, my understanding of that is that the applicants are proposing the 71 units at 80% AMI, um, which meet the requirements of SB 35, 
as well as the city inclusionary ordinance. And as I kind of mentioned in, in my presentation, um, for density bonus, my might rely on Jessica um, in housing to help me with this. Um, she's more of the housing expert. But the due to the funding and depending upon the the funding for this project, that will uh, determine what level of affordability will be required. And there's, there's my understanding is there's numerous options that requirement for density bonus uh, based on number of units at a certain affordability level. So um, that has yet to be determined and we had that discussion with the applicants. And so uh, what we basically were planning to do in that particular case is um, there will be a, a an agree housing agreement that will be required to be recorded as part of this project. And once the funding is determined um, and then we determine what those percentages and what levels of affordability there will be based on that funding, that will be written into the agreement. I think I would just add that the conditions of approval, you know, noting that they have, um, they have applied for uh, both the density bonus as well as SB 35 application, um, as well as having the inclusionary, the city standard inclusionary requirements. You know, there are overlaps between those. And the conditions of approval, the, the staff report um, goes into some detail about that. And the conditions of approval will specify that the, um, that each of those needs to be met um, and, and that, you know, while there, there can be overlap, each of those does need to be met, given that they have requested the um, affordable uh, housing density bonus and the SB 35 application. So, thank you. I just have a quick follow-up. So, mm -hmm. as long as they meet the overall standard, or they, they can say that we are going to have X number of units at a minimum of at an affordability, affordability level that is um, at the maximum 80% of AMI is fine. Is that they don't do the breakdown until later. We, we, we're we required to give them that opportunity to tell us later. Is that what I'm hearing? That's my understanding, yes. Um, Jessica, did you have any, I, I noticed you popped up, I didn't know if you had any comment on that. Yeah, I just wanted to add in that, so the, the applicant has submitted both um, a state application to the California Tax Credit Allocation Committee, as well as State HD, which is Housing and Community Development, IIG, which is Infrastructure Infill Grant. Um, so they're going to be going after multiple funding sources to try to piece together a 100% affordable project. TCAC, we know, is an average affordability level of 60% of AMI and below for 100% of the unit. So at the very least, they will be at that threshold, which is already what, you know, what this minimum is that we're discussing right now. The, the problem is there, you know, it's sort of the tail, tail wagging the dog of, um, you know, they need to show that they have a committed project that has you know, it's shovel ready, ready to go um, in order to get financing. And so they're, they're chasing these funding sources. And unfortunately, those funding sources, each NOFA round, each that they go out for a notice of funding issuance, they, these regulations can change. And what the, the regulator asks for in terms of affordability levels changes. So it's hard for them to, to say right now, this is exactly what we're going in for. But at the very least, we could we can say that they're going. They would meet, be meeting an average affordability level of 60% of AMI and below based on tax credit standards, which is over half of the funding that would be applied to this affordable project. Okay, is that uh, work? Is that uh, yeah? For, yeah. Again? Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Next, I've got uh, Councilmember Golder and then Councilmember Colantari Johnson. Uh, many of my questions have already been asked, but I just have a question and 
Um, I didn't really dawn on me until um, you said that the applicant was requesting um, a waiver for the um, the EV um, charging stations. How many EV charging stations will they have, or what percentage of the parking lot will be EV? Um, let's see. I think they're required 12% of the parking spaces to be EV, which uh, I think we count to be 18, and they're providing six. Uh, 12 less than what would normally be required by our zoning ordinance. So with just six EV parking spaces and the state moving to all EV vehicles within less than 10 years, how is that not an impact to like public health given the vast uh, California emissions and you know the, the extensive work that's been done to reduce that statewide and, and work towards um, climate change? Not aware of any health and safety standards that specifically address that climate change um, statement there. I, so I, I can't say that I'm aware of that. And I think that gets back to what Tony was saying earlier is that we would have to have written uh, a, a standard that is written and objective, specifically calls out it as uh, it recalls something out as a um, health and safety standard that's being violated. Do you have something you wanted to add, Tony? Yeah, just to just to uh, refer back to the statute, uh, it refers to a significant quant direct and unavoidable impact based on objective identified written public health or safety standards, and so. Uh, if, if there was a standard that specified a minimum number um, based on um, specific health and safety policies, then, <clears throat> then we could rely on that. But we don't have a standard um, that, that establishes a, a public health and safety standard for a minimum number of EV charging stations. I just, I guess it just, it just seems like uh, it must be written somewhere. It seems like common sense. We're moving towards, um, you, you know, free of fossil fuels in the next decade. That's the goal of the state. I, I can't imagine building a building that's meant to pump 30, 50, 100 years and not planning um, for that significant infrastructure. I think that's, that's a good point. But just like all of the concessions and waivers that are being requested, um, you know, there are good reasons why we have all of our existing zoning criteria and regulations and to make a decision on these concessions and waivers, we have to really be able to point to something specific. All right. Um, I, thank you. Um, I can just add to that, if I could just add to that real quick. Um, all of the lists will be EV ready. Um, EVSE is a really specific thing surface parking space, but all of the lists will be um, will be EV ready, 100%. And by that, Sam, you mean that the conduit will be in place such that the wiring can be easily run to accommodate future lifts or future um, charging stations? Yeah. Thank you. Councilmember Colder, was that it on your question? Yeah, everyone kind of touched on my other questions. Thank you. Okay. Next, I have Council Member Colin Perry Johnson, and then uh, Vice Mayor Bruner will be after that. Thank you. Um, that was actually one of my questions, so I'll pick, pick it up maybe where Council Member Golder left. Defining health and safety and having something quantifiable. Um, I, I wonder if we can actually ask our climate action manager uh, and those folks in in the city who are working on our climate action response and who worked on Vision Zero. Um, it seems that the, I can't point to it right now, but it seems to have some measure that shows that um, uh, working towards 100% electric vehicles is what we want to do, and, and how would it, it would impact our um, our emissions and and how it impacts sustainability in the long run. So, so I guess that's a that's a question. If we can dive a little bit deeper into that specific concession. Um, sort of along those lines, you know, one other, okay, let me back up. I guess I would like some clarity on 
how we define minor deficiencies. Uh, I saw that one of those were um, sufficient bike uh, parking spaces. So it kind of goes along with this conversation that we're having to move away from uh, regular vehicles and um, support EV and bicycling. So that was a minor deficiency that was noted as not meeting the objective standard. Um, so that's just a specific example, but how do we how do we define what's a minor deficiency and what's not? So I'll ask all my questions maybe and then and then pause if that's okay. Um, the other question I had, and I don't know if we can answer this, is you know, so it's um the 123, right, that we're short of in our arena goals for the very low income. Do we have information in our community? that identifies who, who is our low income in this community and what are their housing needs. Um, the, the majority of the units in, in the 71 affordable housing um, building are uh, studios and one bedrooms, and not all of them, but the majority. So is that going to meet the needs of the very low income? What, what, what are their demographics? What are their needs? Again, I don't know if we have the answer to that question, but will this project, will the 71 units meet those needs? So those are kind of my, my bigger questions. I have some other specific ones, but I'll just pause there. Sure. Um, I think, oh, Nathan, you want to? Yeah, I, want, I wanted to jump in with regards to bike parking and kind of just comment on what may be considered a minor deficiency. Um, you know, when we're evaluating the, the applicant's uh, project here, uh, the bike parking is considered a minor deficiency because uh, while at the time right now it doesn't show the exact type of um, bike parking that's going to be um, provided, um, it is something that we felt that they can do quite easily before their, their deadline. So they'll, they'll incorporate the, the correct type of bike parking and the correct number. It's something that we can easily work with them on. Some of the larger things that we had some issues with over, you know, with regards to that southbound right turn lane, getting an easement, things like that, those were those are kind of considered more of a major issues for us that we need to just solve before that we could um, say that they're complying with the um, uh, the application. So uh, th th those would be the small differences between those two. Thanks, Nathan. Um, and you had a couple other comments or questions slash comments. Uh, the first one. Um, was related to talking with uh, Tiffany Wise West and others who are working on the um, upcoming uh, uh, climate action plan. And um, I think that's a great point with respect to, to considering what um, future written objective quantifiable health and safety standards we include as part of that plan. And I'm happy to talk with Tiffany about that for um, our, our future um, uh, regulations. Um, I will, um, I'll, I'll comment, I'll do a quick comment on the, the VLI. Um, you, so the very low income units, you asked if that meets the needs of this community. And one of the things that we have in our general plan is um, an acknowledgement that we need a wide variety of units and uh, of unit types. And um, I do know that, um, and Jessica DeWitt, I'll to, to speak to this in, in a moment, but I do know that the um, Pacific Station South and Pacific Station North are exploring those um, different grant requirements or grant um, applications that would require a higher percentage of um, two and three bedroom units. And so, um, you know, there are some um, larger units that um, are anticipated to come online. And we do uh, need a variety of units. I think, you know, just speaking really broadly, um, you know, California's population is aging. And as that happens, um, you know, there is more demand and people are, you know, generally waiting longer to have children. And, and so, you know, that, that grouping of larger units um, is smaller in relative terms to the whole overall population needs. That's a broad statement about you know all of California, and I haven't looked specifically at you know the Santa Cruz to tell you the specifics related to that. But um, Jessica can speak to some of the um, other projects that we have coming online, as well as um, the um, just VLI needs in general. 
Jessica, do you yeah. have to add to that? Or I that? just uh, to ditto what Lee is saying that yes, Pacific Station South and North are anticipating family style housing, which the funding that we're going after, which is the ta affordable housing tax credits, there's different buckets of, of you know, types of housing for that you can apply for in ta for tax credits. And so the family grouping pairs 50% two and three bedroom units. So with PAC South and PAC North, those will both have 50% two and three bedroom units. In addition, that Cedar Street Apartments is also looking at a family housing project. So that would be another project that is looking at having 50% two and three bedroom units. The Cedar Street is currently 65 units anticipated. Uh, PAC South is 70 and PAC North is 95 units. So it's quite a few um, two, two and three bedroom units coming on. As they relate to the VLI, we don't have that specific data, but we do know that there's a need for all bedroom types um, across the board. Water Street Apartments has a wait list for one bedrooms and two bedrooms and three bedrooms. So does River Walks currently. They basically all have wait lists right now. What I can speak to on this project in particular, 831, is that the developer is looking to go into a different bucket in the tax credit world that is, is more focused on special needs. And so therefore it, do, it does require having this predominantly studios, one bedrooms associated with it. That's why you're seeing more of those in this type. So, so they're more of a special needs type. So that would include um, transition aid, age homeless, it, the PBVs are associated with it. Um, the developer can speak more to this later, but um, they're looking at more of a special needs focus versus family. Thank you. Can I just ask one quick quick question? Sure. Um, I see uh, um, live workspaces in in the project. Who that's for? Like, what's what are the yeah. When you say who that's for, like, are those, do we know if those are designated as um, affordable units or um, are you just speaking generally what live workspaces are, your, are for? Um, well, both, I guess. Are they affordable units and are they for some any specific type of um, tenant? Yeah, I don't so, believe there's. Uh, go ahead, Ryan. I was just saying, I don't believe they're designated as affordable as those are mainly for the. Um, building B, um, but generally those are for any anyone from uh, you know would be a real estate agent or attorney or or it could even be anyone you know that provides any type of uh, retail business or what have you that just basically lives above that space. So I see. <laughs> there's a connection between the residential and the commercial space where they live above the commercial space. Okay, thanks for clarifying. You know, the design of the the you know the heights and the glazing is such that it can function well as a commercial space, and gives that opportunity for an individual to run the business out of their home. Yeah. Is that um, is that all, Council Member? Yeah, I'm good for now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I've got Council Member Cummings, and then uh, I'm sorry, Vice Mayor Bruner, and then Council Member Cummings. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ryan, for your presentation. And um, thank you, council members, for all the questions, um, which several I had. Um, I guess at this point, my question, just for understanding um, regarding the um, uh, uh, concerns that have been brought forward, such as the driveway, traffic study, the um, the slope conditions, is 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 it that it, they will be addressed at a future process during condition improvement for a building permit by the ministerial process the city does with building permits? Uh, I can answer that question. Um, so yeah, as a part of the traffic study, we'll be asking for for uh, mitigation measures to be provided. Um, and so the the plan is to you know essentially the driveways are located in the best location, but then with the traffic study, we'll we'll apply some mitigation measures 
as conditions of approval when they go for the building permit. Okay. Is that your only question at this yes. point, Councilmember? Yes, thank you. Councilmember Cummings. I mean, excuse me, Vice Mayor. Councilmember Cummings. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mayor. And I want to start by thanking staff for the presentation and for all the questions that my colleagues have posed. I just have one question because I think most of my questions have been asked and, um, and addressed. Um, the one question I had around the concessions and waivers, I'm just wondering if you could speak to what, um, you know, if, if the applicant's asking for concessions and waivers, to what extent does the city council or what um, authority does the city council have to either accept or reject those concessions? Because it sounds like some of the concessions are really against many of our policies around, you know, whether it's health and all policies or climate action policies. Um, and so I'm just wondering, you know, to what extent we're required to um, approve concessions and waivers. And Lee, you're muted. Yeah. Sorry. I'd like to think that um, we've got good reasons for all of our policies and requirements. And, and I would say that, you know, I expect that most of them we do. Um, and, um, you know, certainly with the ones called out um, as Council Member Watkins did, you know, there are very good reasons for um, integrating affordable uh, housing units in with the rest of the project, for example. Um, with respect to our ability to, um, to deny needs to be based on um, quantifiable health and safety standards that cannot be mitigated. Um, and I will say there are a couple of other bars that need to be met, you know, for um, concessions and incentives, um, they need to identify a, a cost reduction. They need to make it more affordable to, to build. Um, and so, you know, if they put all the affordable units into a single building and that gets them, I think they were looking at a $23 million um, tax credit. Um, so if that gets them the $23 million, you know, that's clearly making it more affordable. So that's one bar that's being met. Um, then we would just need to establish that there isn't a written quantifiable health and safety standard that they are, um, uh, that they're violating. The waivers, it's slightly different. It just needs to, the first bar is that it physically precludes the development from occurring. Um, so, and that includes with the additional units. So with the waivers, it's, it's typical for height um, or setbacks, you know, you, you know, you might not increase the height, but you might and have no setbacks um, throughout the, the building. But you would expect that with a project, particularly if they're using the 50% density bonus, as this one is, um, even though they're not utilizing that whole 50%, they're qualifying for the 50% density bonus. And we saw that regularly with the 35% density bonus prior maximum amount that you could increase we saw the need to go higher. Um, and and um, so they, for waivers, need to establish the first bar. It's physically precluding them from, the standard is physically precluding them. Um, and then the second bar is the same, the, the um, health and safety standards. That's, is that all, Council Member Cummings? Okay. Yes, yeah, if I could just follow up on that a little sure. bit. I think that, um, if you look at the waivers and concessions that you're requiring, I mean, comment, council members have made comments about the EV charging stations and um, the, the entry and, and other issues. But if you look at the waivers that you're requiring, they're really good reasons for all of the zoning code standards that we um, have in our code, such as the height limit. Um, you know, and the record is rife with um, very good reasons why a height limit is important in this um, in this particular case, as well as reductions in private open space requirements. I mean, they're really good. We require open space uh, in connection with private developments um, and common open space areas as well. Um, and then there are good reasons why we have maximum floor area ratios and density requirements. Um, 
they're, they're valid. But in order to um, in order to deny a request in session, we have to be able to make those findings based on objective health and safety standards. And so, you know, you can you can argue that all of these are important requirements of our code that are being asked. You know, that the that the developer is requesting waivers or concessions with respect to. Um, and, and our task is to try to identify objective health and safety standards that that waiving those um, would run afoul of. Thanks, Tony. And uh, yeah, my questions really, uh, most of my questions have been asked as well. I just want to clarify, it's just been a lot of information. Um, I, I wrote down that the applicant had not committed to the turn lane that was going to be required. Is that true? No, they, they have committed to that. They have committed to that. Okay. Yeah. And Tony, um, you sort of picked up on, I mean, really we've rolled back, well, not rolled back, but the waivers that we're providing are basically the things that make this um, proposal not really amenable to the neighbors and the community at this point. And to your point, Tony, um, you know, those are the things, you know, maximum height reduction, you know, having private and common open space and then having a floor area ratio and density that fits with the community kind of feel. And, you know, so so those are the things that we're sort of, you know, those are the things we're losing in a sense control of right now. And that's kind of what SB 35, unfortunately, is doing to the community right now. And um, anyways, that's a comment. I, I won't go too far down that. but. Um, my other question um, revolved around the, um, so we are 123 units short on our arena goals. And I know for a fact that we are, I believe, um, I'm sure one of many public agencies that are trying to build housing in their communities with, within our own, you know, ownership pattern of properties that we do own. Um, I guess, Jessica, I'm just curious, are we competing against uh, folks who are trying to build affordable housing? Are we all in the same pot or are folks actually going up after different sources? So I'm just curious about that because if we're able to, uh, for example, finish off Pacific Station South, that's 170 units. So I'm just curious about what the relationship there is. Do we get a different pot because we're a public agency or are we all competing for the same fund? Uh, there, there's no different pot. We're all competing for the same funds. Um, there are certain uh, funding programs that the city can for that a developer, they're, they're few and far between, but there are a few, like the local housing trust fund is one where the city did apply last year and we applied again this year. Um, so we're, we're trying everything we can to get as much funding, um, you know, to port towards affordable housing projects in the city. And the more that we can help subsidize those projects, the more we can request for affordability to be able to offset the cost of, of having that um, lower and very low income unit. Thank you, Jessica. My other question was really around um, more of the kind of the, the impact fees. Um, does SB 35 roll back impact fees and any other fees that would be charged to the developer that might provide, you know, public benefits? So I'm thinking, our uh, child care fee doesn't apply to affordable projects. I'm just curious, Lee, is there any is there any incentive or anything like that that we give in terms of those impact fees, or do we collect those those typical fees based on the development um, for footage and things like that? Good question. Um, the um, the zoning ordinance actually has um, an, uh, a process whereby a developer can request. Um, the waiving or deferral of certain fees. Um, and that's just for the affordable units. Um, the zoning ordinance doesn't specify that um, it has to be a 100% affordable project, but I will say that um, in my four years here, it's only been 100% um, affordable projects that, that has been granted for. Um, but there is a process whereby that um, can be requested. And that process goes to the city council. And I will say that I am not aware of requirements through SB 35 or otherwise in state law that 
requires us to waive any impact fees um, or um, uh, fees, service fees, like the cost of our building permit or the cost of our um, time in reviewing the planning application and so forth. Okay. I guess my is um, I just want to confirm what I think I heard, which is under the density bonus law, there could have been zero parking uh, spaces provided. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Red, yep, go ahead, Ryan. Thanks. Yeah, you, you're correct. That's SB 35, uh, if, we, if you're within a sense of a, a transit, I um, forget the exact wording exactly, but uh, then you qualify and you don't have to provide any how, uh, any parking on site, and that is they qualify in this particular case. So they are not required to provide parking on site. That being said, they are providing, I think, 143 uh, spaces. Okay. Okay, great. That's it on my questions. Um, so, uh, so I'm sorry, we're trying to keep this as efficient as possible, um, but we are now going to turn um, this over. I'm just checking to see that there's no further count, uh, questions from council at this time, and I'm not seeing any hands up. Okay. So if there are no further questions from the council, we are going to move into public Due to the amount of public interest in this project, we want to make sure that everyone has a chance to share their feedback. To facilitate that, we are taking public comment in two ways tonight. First, we're going to take a 45-minute recess, at which time that just the council will be recessing, at which time the public is invited to comment via a web-based collaboration tool. This, the comments will be closed and a summary will be shared with the council. The next the full text of your comments will also be shared with planning staff for their review for this and future projects. Following the summary, we will open up the traditional public comment period for 45 minutes, and I have approved three groups for extra time, and they will be given two minutes, and everyone else will receive a minute. I'm going to invite, uh, I just want to just give the folks who have extra time a little bit of a heads up. The extra time groups are 831 Responsible Development. Uh, and Guy Lasnier we're gonna, is going to speak for that. Santa Cruz tomorrow, Laura Lira Filippini, and then Housing Santa Cruz County, and that will be Don Lane. I'll now invite our communications manager, Elizabeth Smith, to walk us through how the public can engage via the web-based collaboration tool. Thanks, Donna. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, so, um, oops, there's one more thing to do. Publish this. Um, so you can reach the web-based tool by going to this, using the QR code on your phone if you're, if you are, um, are you, if you're viewing this on a computer and want to access it on, on your phone, you can use the QR code, the URL to um, reach the website where we'll be doing the, it's called Padlet. Um, is bit.ly slash 831water, or you can re um, go into the project page, cityofsantacruz.com slash 831water. And when you get there, this is what it's going to look like. Um, and again, here, here's the information for anyone who's tuning in. Here's the email, here's the URL. Um, it's called Padlet. There are different categories that you can use to provide your feedback. Um, if you have ideas about or comments around the affordable housing, the building design, objective standards, um, you'll go into the Padlet, um, click the plus sign, and, and up will come a, a topic. And you can write in test. I'll write in test and test just to show you what happens. Um, and then when, once you finish writing your comment, you hit publish. As you can see, the topics go from left to right. So you'll scroll on your computer or you will um, scroll with your fingers on a phone or a tablet. Um, and then if you like someone's uh, comment, you can part it um, or you can respond to a comment um, by typing in the box below it. So we'll leave this open for 45 minutes. Um, we're asking for folks 
disrespectful. Um, any comments that are profane or per include personal attacks, well, I'll be sitting here watching, and so we'll probably take those off. Um, but we do want a robust conversation, um, and um, I want to give you an opportunity to um, to provide your feedback. So um, I'll also be around, and so um, uh, I'll be monitoring my email. If you have a, a problem, you can email me at esmith at cityofsantacruz.com. Um, all right. We look forward to your feedback. Thank you. So the council will adjourn, and we will come back in at 6.50, and then we will have the one-minute uh, public comment period. Uh, first, before that, we're three extra time, and then we'll go into the 45-minute comment period. So thank you, everyone. If you can get your comments done on this, you don't have to stay for public comment in the evening. You can watch and take a re relax and not stand in line. Uh, we're just trying to give folks enough uh, different ways to get the news to us that, that they feel uh, appropriate. So thank you, everyone.
Okay. Okay. If council members can turn on their um, cameras, when they get back, we will start up. <clears throat> Elizabeth, are you feeling like we're good to go once we come back in, or do you? My collaborators are still writing, and so just want to make sure that they're, that my collaborators, Rosemary being one of my collaborators, is ready to go. <laughs> okay. I'm ready, Elizabeth. Okay, okay great. Okay. Um, Great. We'll, um, we'll come back into session. I, it looks like all the council members are here. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll turn it over to uh, Elizabeth and Rosemary. Yeah, Elizabeth is going to take this. Okay, so we tried to go through and at least at the highest level get um, capture what we were hearing from folks um, in the uh, digital engagement. Uh, as a, as a side note, I'd love to hear from the public who, who did engage in this process, how it went and uh, and uh, whether it was a positive addition to, to our council meeting. Um, on the side of affordable housing, lots of, lots of uh, uh, concerns around segregating the affordable housing. We saw that throughout the categories. Honestly, I think people saw that as a, as a consistent um, question mark about this particular project. Um, lots of resounding, yes, more affordable housing, um, please. And then um, concerns about there being too many studios and too few family-sized units. So, you know, really wanting this uh, the affordable housing components of this project to meet the needs of um, families who live in Santa Cruz. Um, and then, you know, you see the opposite, that our demographics are shifting and we need more smaller units. Um, as they are proposed in this development. So it seems like on every on every issue, there's a point and a counterpoint, and so we'll go through those. Um, on the building design, again, uh, they like some people like the feature. Some think people think that it should be reserved for solar to make it a more sustainable building. Um, concerns about lack of setbacks and the impacts on the surrounding houses from shade, um, people looking into their yards. Um, uh, concerns about the impact of unbundled parking on the surrounding neighborhoods, and just a bit on that, that the, that folks won't want to pay for the parking and instead will be um, dispersing throughout the neighborhood, seeing the difficulty of parking in the neighborhood. Concerns about drainage and geologic features on the site. Um, I think the, the drainage issue has come up um, both in the um, comments that came before the council meeting, and then also we saw that in the digital, in the padlet. On the size, um, shading on, neighbor, on neighboring houses, that um, the building is too big for the number of units that we're getting from the project, or that it's too small and it needs to provide more housing, um, that it doesn't fit the surrounding community feel, um, and that the building is too tall, takes up too much of the site, Again, this is, goes to the setbacks. It, it makes it impossible for delivery vehicles. It's just sort of an, um, a foreboding structure there on the corner. Turns about that. On the transportation side, 
Um, concerns, again, that there's not enough parking for the units and the impact that that'll have on the surrounding neighborhood. Some folks want there to be less parking so that we're encouraging people to take public transit. Um, lots of comments on bike safety and ideas around how to solve um, with the current design, how to maybe uh, solve within the roadway um, protecting bicyclists. Um, garage egress, so again, safety for bikes, cars and pedestrians, making sure that we're doing everything we can um, to take that into account. Um, and then thinking about deliveries, service vehicles, kind of backing out into brand authority. On the objective standard side, we had folks who said, this process is too subjective. And then we had other folks who said, you know, it really seems like the objective concerns about um, health and safety, in particular around Vision Zero, I'm wondering if that is a stated um, health and safety issue that could, could be used um, to talk with the developer. Um, the parcels should not be allowed to be separated later. There was concerns about, you know, what does this mean for the project that one half of it could be sold for a different use? Um, that it's inconsistent with many city policies. The Vision Zero is one climate action, health and all policies. Over and over, we're hearing about the segregation of low-income housing. So that's a, that's a true community concern that, that continues to come up. Um, and then uh, in the other bucket, um, just uh, there were a few comments across, across the um, Padlet that had some concerns about Novin as a developer. Um, and then, uh, again, concerns about redlining for that segregation concept. Okay. Thank you, Elizabeth, for doing that. And yeah, please send Elizabeth a note for those folks in the audience tonight. We're trying out and testing out new ways to get public comment and look at, um, you know, trying to make our meetings a little more efficient. Please send a note to uh, any of us on your experience on that. Um, okay. Uh, my understanding now is that um, I would like to go ahead and chew up uh, if you're interested in participating in the oral in the oral commenting period. Uh, I'd like you to now press nine to raise your hand, um, and that way we can uh, see who's chewed and wanting to do that. Um, the other thing that uh, we'll do is we will have extra time for three groups. Uh, for those individuals, you'll have one minute, and the groups will have two minutes. Um, I learned during the break that actually the developer um, had asked for a period of time for uh, making some comments, and um, based on our sort of schedule, I'm going to go ahead and have um, the developer uh, come forward now and uh, address the council. And uh, let me, um, let's see, hang on one sec. I want to make sure I got the right folks who will be coming forward. Um, hang on one sec, sorry. Okay. Uh, my understanding, it'll be Amon Novin from Novin Development, Amara Morrison, Wendell Rosen, uh, LLP, and, and that's the applicant's attorney, and Amon is the applicant, and Mark Donahue, uh, Lowney, Ar Lowney Architecture, and he's the project architect. So I'd like to welcome those three folks uh, to come on on and turn on your cameras, and we'll go ahead and give you 10 minutes. Good evening, Amon. Good evening. Um, I'm not sure if the other members of my team are on here yet, but I'm happy to kick us off. Okay. Um, I'm with you, Amon. Really oh, there we go. And I, Amara, I also promoted to panelist, but I'm not seeing her pop up. So she, oh, okay. she, she just came on. Good evening, Mark. And Amara. Okay, I'm on. Kick it off. Thank you, Mayor Myers and members of the council um, for spending your evening here with us today. Um, my name is Juan Novin. I'm president of Novin Development Corporation. Um, and I wanted to make a few comments about um, our project uh, before I hand it off to our architect and um, land use attorney. Um, so, you know, 831 Water Street is about increasing the supply of affordable housing, um, helping the environment and making sure that generations of Santa Cruzians that want to continue to call it home can afford to live here. Um, with 140 units, we have 71 units 
feed restricted for 55 years to low and very low income residents. Amon, could you, I'm sorry to interrupt, could you speak a little bit closer to your speaker? I think that might be helpful. We're just, it's Absolutely. a little hard to hear. Is this Thank a little you. bit better? That's better, yeah. Thank you. Um, and then in addition to the 71 low and very low income deed restricted units are 69 units uh, targeting middle income households. Um, this mixed income approach addresses a broad range of housing needs from the most vulnerable, hard to serve populations to the critical workforce. Um, 831 Water Street is about moving past politics to make sure people can continue to live here and that future generations don't struggle with affordability because that's what really matters. Um, I don't see a four and five story building as high rise. I don't think it's unreasonable to build it along a major transit corridor where we desperately need housing as well as ground level community serving retail to liven the pedestrian experience, including the artist live work loss. Um, we need to be doing everything we can to make Santa Cruz more inclusive and accessible for current workers who commute too far to be here and for future generations. The only way to do this is to build more homes to address our chronic housing shortage. Um, the one thing that we can be doing to address greenhouse gas emissions is build more infill housing near, trans near transit. Um, this project is literally taking a 100% paved car-centric commercial strip center with a car wash and building sustainable homes for individuals and families who are right now searching on Craigslist saying, I cannot find a home uh, affordable that I that I could live in the city. I can't find a home near my job. I can't find a home to live close to my family. Um, so I really applaud city staff and council in taking uh, this major step to address our housing shortage. Um, if we're serious about tackling poverty and homelessness, and having diverse communities, we should be creatively finding ways to provide more housing in all parts of the city. It's also about equity. We have historically focused our growth in a few small parts of the city. We need to have housing everywhere. People in this neighborhood also need more housing. Um, polling shows that despite some very loud voices that don't want change, who spend 10 hours at planning commission hearings and, and may seem like they're the majority, they're not. The majority of folks understand we need more housing, want more housing, understand about the future of the city, and want to make sure that their kids have a place to live and are willing to accept more housing in their neighborhoods and make room for others. Um, again, I want to thank staff who has worked diligently to help us get here, um, as well as organizations like Monterey Bay Economic Partnership, the Chamber Business Council, and uh, Grassroots Santa Cruz EMB Movement, um, who want to make sure that we have more sustainable and attainable housing. Uh, with that, I'll hand it off to Mark Donahue to answer some questions around uh, the EV chargers and uh, the project integration. Um, and I know Amra wants to make some comments as well. So thank you. Thank you, Mon. I'm going to focus on three primary issues. There seemed to be a question about the infrastructure for the EV parking, and I know uh, it, uh, it's somewhat mysterious, especially when you look at the mechanical stackers as part of the uh, mix. But uh, of the 136 stalls that we have designated for the parking garage, 130 of them will be EV, either EV equipped or EV ready. And so we, we recognize uh, as both as uh, our client as both, and as the architecture firm that um, by 2030, there will be no more cars sold in the uh, in the state that are gasoline fueled, which is fantastic news, ready for the infrastructure to accept this influx, especially since the lifetime of the building, I think somebody uh, pointed out earlier, is gonna be probably around 50 years or more. And so even though we know the technology is gonna change, uh, hopefully what happens is that cars will uh, charge while they're running in the sun. But for the meantime, we definitely have designed that infrastructure to handle uh, the current need. On that same theme of uh, of uh, environmentally friendly, I think I'm going to reiterate something that Iman said. The most environmentally uh, sustainable thing that you can do when it comes to housing is build dense housing. Uh, single family homes are the least environmentally friendly way to house people. They take up a lot of land, they use a lot of energy, and so it's simply not a good way to fulfill the need for housing in the city. 
so we definitely have the density, which is, uh, I know, the topic of concern. Um, the building utilizes passive solar technology, so we're using uh, shading in coordination with sun angles to shade the building from the summer heat and then to provide uh, shine during the winter when the uh, sun is lower in the sky. Uh, the buildings are all electric, so there's no use of gas at all. And so therefore, with California's increasingly sustainable grid, we're able to deliver sustainable energy to the building and use it. And then I think there was a question about uh, using the roof for solar. Um, one of the things, one of the emerging trends that individual solar panels on buildings are difficult because they require a great deal of maintenance. And uh, also it's inefficient. Uh, the best way to do it is to add sustainable energy to the grid. And so you're actually able to purchase uh, green power credits off of the grid. And what that does, it helps to subsidize grid-wide improvements so that all electricity becomes more sustainable. And then finally, I think the, one of the biggest questions that came up, uh, I was also reading the comments as they came up, is this notion of segregation. And I'm just uh, once more going to reiterate what you've heard a few times. This is simply a function of the way these buildings are financed. Uh, our firm specializes in supportive and affordable housing. And what we have, we're working on several projects where you have a market rate component and you have an affordable component, and uh, they are often on the same lot but in different buildings, or there's uh, lots that are deed restricted within, say, four parcel development. And, uh, and just because of the tax finance structure, which is the main source of, of uh, finance for the affordable projects, that's just a natural outcome of the way that our state laws are written uh, and the way that the tax credits are done. So the other thing I want to point out, if I may share my screen for just a moment, make sure I get the right one, is that even though uh, we talk, the conversation has been about uh, segregation, it's actually not a segregated building. Um, if you look at the plan, A, which is the one on the right, is the uh, what I'll characterize it more as workforce housing than market rate. And the building on the left is the affordable component. What you'll notice is that circulation is tied together. And so we've actually designed the building in such a way that interaction between the two sides of the building is uh, not only uh, available, but required. You can see that there's an elevator located in the center and the plan there is to make it available to people who are going in and out uh, through this passageway, but it's uh, entered from both sides. We've also designed the exiting system. Mark, so, yes, Mark, I'm sorry. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you to wrap up because I'm we've yes. got a ton of people ask, uh, waiting, and and you're ten coming out. So I just want to make sure if there's any other things you guys want to um, present. No, I think uh, I will just uh, uh, defer to Amra. I think this. Uh, the diagram speaks for itself. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. I'm sorry to interrupt. Just no problem. Lots of time constraints. Thank you. Amara, go ahead, please. Uh, hang on just one moment, please. Um, Mark, if you wouldn't mind, thank you. Um, <laughs> I you don't. Mayor Myers and members of the council, my name is Amara Morrison, and I and I do represent um, Novin Development Con Company in connection with the SB35 application before you tonight. Um, we did submit a letter to you earlier today in response to the letter which you received uh, yesterday from the Whitworth Perkin firm. And I know a lot of attention has been devoted today um, to the issue of segregation, which I think Mark has just um, addressed from a design standpoint. Um, but I would like to, to just sort of underscore some of the legal reasons why um, this requested concession is, is appropriate. Uh, number one, state density bonus law specifically allows the affordable units to be in a location other than where the market rate or bonus units are located. And it, and it really, state law does not mandate the dispersal of affordable units. Um, number two, the SB 35 implementing guidelines, which are published by the Department of Housing and Community Development, also specifically allow for the non-dispersal dispersal of the affordable units citing limitations which are imposed by state and local financing um, and which we have, I think, articulated in our density bonus uh, statement. And as your city attorney explained earlier this afternoon, 
uh, the city's discretion to, the, to deny this requested concession is really quite limited and can only be based upon substantial evidence that the requested concession is not going to result in actual cost savings in order to provide for the production of affordable housing. Um, and you'll note in our density bonus statement that we have identified projects tax credit funding for the affordable units uh, will result in a cost reduction of nearly 18 million. Um, and just a couple of other points that came up during council's questions following the staff report. I'll just give you one more minute if you don't mind. Oh, okay. okay, all right. Well, we would like to just refocus council's attention on the purpose of today's public oversight meeting, and that really is to review the objective standards matrix and determine the project's consistency with these objective standards. Um, and second, to the extent that the city wishes to further study conditions like the driveway placement or traffic which is generated by the project, uh, SB 35 guidelines are clear that a project which is approved pursuant to SB 35 can't be conditioned on something other than your standard conditions of approval. And those are standards which are knowable to the public and the, ad, and the applicant at the time of the SB um, 35 application. And I would refer the council to, and to, to an email that was received um, by HCD yesterday in which we forwarded um, to staff uh, yesterday. And I do wanna thank you very much for your time and attention. I know that this is a difficult um, matter and, and we really appreciate your hard work on this, on this issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Amon and Mark and Amara. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and um, turn back to our oral, oral public comments now. And um, the first group I have up is going to be represented as 831 Responsible Development, and it's Guy Lavnier. And Guy, I hope I didn't uh, pronounce your uh, name incorrectly. I, I hope you're on and um, Hi. yeah, we can. Great, you're here. Um, yeah, go ahead and you have two minutes and you'll hear a timer, a ding if you're going over. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Mayor. Um, a, a little bit, it's Lanier, but that's okay. okay. Um, I speak tonight on behalf of 831 Responsible Development and the nearly 600 community members who've signed our petition against this ill-conceived and haphazardly submitted project. To be clear, we think affordable housing on the small lot at 831 Water Street is a worthy idea, but the current proposal is a careless overreach not compatible with the neighborhood, the city, or community values. And I did get a, I did uh, see a great deal of sensitivity over some of our main issues tonight with the responses from the Novin development. There are too many issues to list in the allotted time, so I'll speak generally of our opposition on bad public policy. As elected stewards of Santa Cruz and its environment, you have the responsibility to ensure that developments in our city not only meet local and state requirements, but are responsibly cited and designed and are protective of public health and safety. Please exercise that authority as it's clear that the current Novin development project would seriously imperil the health and safety of many in our community. This is the project to be the first in Santa Cruz to be fast-tracked. It is wrong because it lowers standards to an unacceptable level for other significant projects expected in the future. It proposes to segregate low-income tenants in a separate building from high-income tenants contrary to public policy and the law. Dispersal of affordable units is a requirement for SB 34, the ministerial streamlining set forth by the state. The city's own regulation mandate that affordable units may not be segregated from market rate units. The proposed density scale and design creates serious public safety impacts on heavily trafficked streets close to a school, creating substantial risk for pedestrians, cyclists, drivers, and in particular, students. We are to deny the project as currently proposed on the grounds that the separation of affordable units from market rate units is against SB 35 regulations and no consent waivers or incentives can be given at this time because the density bonus application is not complete. We want more affordable housing. We want responsible development and a process that is upfront and honest. We believe we can work together in an open public process to create safe and responsible development for Santa Cruz and its citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Santa Cruz tomorrow and it'll be Lyra Filippini. Bonnie, is she in? She is. 
Okay. Go ahead, Lyra. You should be able to speak. Lyra, we can't hear you. Um, try, try pressing star six. Uh, let's see. You on an iPad or a computer? Hello? There we go. Yeah, go ahead, please. Sorry about that. Hi, Lyra Filippini speaking for Santa Cruz tomorrow. We urge the city council to deny the current application on the grounds that the density bonus application is incomplete and non-compliant to city code and that the SB 35 application violates HCD regulations. Their regulations SB 35 require distribution of the affordable units throughout the development. The regulations for California tax credit funding mentioned do not say that one parcel containing deed restricted affordable units can't also include market rate units in the development. Additionally, two of our city's ordinances also require dispersal of the units throughout the development. In fact, it is one of the city's regulatory standards for affordable units to qualify a development for a density bonus. Per city code, the density bonus application is also incomplete. The various income brackets by AMI are required to be included in the table. They are nowhere in the application. Additionally, the required location of the density bonus units are not included in the site plan. These omissions make the density bonus application incomplete, and what has been submitted shows the proposal for density bonus due to segregation. Without a density bonus, the SB 35 application may not be assessed at the size and density proposed, and no waivers or objective standards or concessions may be granted. Approving this project would promote segregation of the lower income residents from the higher income residents, which is bad public policy and arguably detrimental to public health. Both state and jurisdictional code clearly contend that segregated development practices are to be avoided. We know that an affordable housing project can be built on the site that is safe and equitable for those living in it, as well as for the surrounding community. We look forward to seeing a development proposal for this location, that is. We are relying on council to protect the community and our city standards and to deny the current proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for, for your gist of your statement. Next, I have Housing Santa Cruz County and Don Lane, I believe, is going to be the speaker. Thank you. Am I coming through? You are. Great. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Don Lane. I'm speaking on behalf of Housing Santa Cruz County. We're a diverse coalition that includes more than 30 community organizations. We work for a thriving, equitable community through our advocacy for a more affordable housing opportunity. I want to acknowledge right up front that this project presents a difficult challenge for many neighborhood residents and for you city council members. I think the reason is quite simple. The project has come forward under the relatively new state law, SB 35. Obviously, there are other issues and other, if not for the new SB 35 process, which mandates a lot less local discretion, this debate would be much easier for you as city council, council members to navigate. The SB 35 process was created because local opposition to creating new apartments has been one contributor to the state's and Santa Cruz's severe housing shortage. In order to make headway on this housing crisis, we needed a change so that opposition by adjacent property owners and homeowners would not be the primary factor in determining how many affordable housing units we will have in our community. The state legislature has been completely clear on this. For an active community like ours, this is a big change and it's one that is very hard for some of us to swallow. Convert However, many lower income people have had to swallow the affordable apartment shortage and housing insecurity and even homelessness, which those past practices delivered. In this time of rising understanding of the need to address past inequities, I believe we're called upon to make some difficult and uncomfortable changes. You have the opportunity to do that today with this project. We urge you to appropriately step out of the way so homes for essential workers, lower income families, and vulnerable people can become a reality. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, next we're going to run it. We're going to go into our public comment time. Folks will have a minute, and I'm just going to go right down here. If you do want to speak to this item, I'd appreciate if you could um, raise your hand by pressing star nine so I get a sense of how many folks are um, planning to talk tonight. Okay, uh, next will be Kyle Kelly, and you'll need to press star six to unmute yourself, and then you'll be able to speak. Hey, all, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you, Don Lane, for the great comments. Um, I'm in big support of this project, um, and I'm really glad people are starting to think about segregation and, and where market rate housing is and where affordable housing is even allowed. Uh, most of the area around where this project is currently does not allow affordable housing. It only allows single-family homes and has no inclusionary requirement or affordable housing allotment. So. If the people tonight speaking in, in this manner really believe this, I expect them to show up for later discussions of ensuring that we have affordable housing citywide. So for this project in this moment, please approve the project, use objective standards to say anything tonight, which makes the city council look like a subjective body and follow the law as best you can. Good luck. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Next, I have phone number ending in 8480. Hi, this is Doug Engfer. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right, thank you. Um, my wife, Robin, and I ask you to please reject the current application based on its noncompliance with the city's objective standards. The design is noncompliant with the clearly objective 270-foot line of sight requirement at the posted 30 mile per hour speed limit on Water Street. There can be no intellectually honest suggestion that this is anything but an objective standard. Also, please reject concessions regarding forced segregated housing. Right is right, wrong is wrong, and there's a clear workaround for this segregation. If, however, council feels compelled to approve the current design, please refuse consideration of any fee waivers. The developer has not earned any such consideration from the city and the city is not obligated to offer them as Tony has outlined. Remember as well that the liability adhering to the city and building owners due to the manifestly unsafe conditions around this project will dwarf any possible costs associated with any potential litigation over SB 35. Please do the right thing for our town. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Next up, I have Simon Gurbani. Hi, um, I'm a resident of Belvedere Terrace and not a powerless in terms of the objective standards. So I'm actually just going to voice an opinion and a request. Um, when I met Mr. Novin, when he visited our street, he said it was vulgar to talk about how much profit was being made. And he compared himself to me, a teacher who does a job and gets paid a fair wage. But as a state employee, I have to publish my salary. It has to be known because there's government money going into it. And the project is using so much in terms of government money, but I think it would be only fair that we know how much profit has been made by Novin. Because as far as I can see, he's trying to gouge a piece of social legislation that is intended to stop people rejecting the presence of low-income housing in order to build as much as he can to make as much profit as possible. The spirit of this legislation was not to say build high buildings as much as possible. It was to say you cannot reject low-income housing in your area. Everybody on our street, everybody on our street is all the three stories of low-income housing. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I have Rafa Sonatel. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I think it's, it's no secret that I'm uh, supportive of this project uh, uh, with 71 uh, units, including many of which will have um, uh, project-based vouchers for uh, uh, people uh, uh, who may have been experiencing homelessness or um, uh, transition age youth. Um, all of those are really admirable qualities of the project. Um, unfortunately, can what everyone else thinks um, shouldn't really come into the equation tonight. 
It's really just about following the law, uh, following the objective standards that are required. It seems pretty obvious that um, you're obligated to approve the project tonight. And even if this wasn't an SB 35 project, uh, it would still be um, required to be approved under the Housing Account Accountability Act. Um, so there's really no legal mechanism that the city has to deny this project. It's a wonderful project. I don't think you, you should deny it and you won't deny it. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Next is Elizabeth Conlon. Hello, everyone. This is Elizabeth. I urge you to follow staff recommendation and approve the 831 Water Street project. There are many things to like about this project, and yet many oppose it, and some of it need to be critically examined. The goalposts are constantly moving. A project isn't affordable enough, or it isn't in the right location, or the right type of affordable housing. If you are concerned that these two buildings will be separated by income, then you should oppose all 100% affordable housing projects as those buildings separate neighbors by income. Some supporters of organized labor ignore that the project is paying prevailing wage and employing skilled and trained union workers. Valid concerns about drought and water use morph into a ignoring that restricting home building hasn't stopped population growth but contributed to overcrowding and homelessness. An apartment is not a punishment for a neighborhood, and housing isn't a burden for a city. It is an opportunity to make our community stronger and more inclusive. Please follow objective standards and approve this application. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I have phone number ending in 0593. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Thank you for the time to speak today. My name is James Rodriguez, and I'm a field representative with Carpenters Local 505. I'm here speaking in support of the Water Street project because with Novin's commitment to use the union signatory general contractor, this project will offer many job opportunities for union carpenter men and women, many of whom live and spend their earnings right here locally, all making a livable wage with medical and retirement benefits, allowing them to continue to live here and contribute to the community they call home. We believe this is a responsible project and look forward to seeing it built. Thank you. Next, I have Lucas Hankel. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I'm a fourth period carpenter apprentice. I'm a member of the Carpenters Local 505. I live here in Santa Cruz and could greatly benefit along with my brother and sister carpenters from this project. I would like to allow to build something to be proud of, proud of in my hometown while advancing myself in a trade, working towards a, res a, a respectable retirement. I look forward to seeing this project move forward, and thank you again for your time. Thank you. Next, I see phone number ending in 696. Hi, Hi. Uh, this is Robert Uzi speaking. Robert, if you have another um, device on, can yeah. you mute that device? Thanks. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you better now. A large contingent of concerned Santa Cruz neighbors is appealing to you to be in denying this proposed development. You are our elected officials. We depend on you to keep our city both safe and healthy. This large-scale development would have both safety and healthy health impacts, not only on neighboring residents, but citywide as well. Water Street is a major arterial and is a popular route for citizens traveling east and west. The B40 intersection is already a bottleneck. Additional traffic would result in frequent gridlock, especially during commute hours. Please be our advocates. Stand up. Speak for us. Health in all policies was a pre-existing condition when this application was submitted. Let us know you do care about our health and safety. After all, these are true objective standards. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I have Rosa. Press star. Oh, I lost Rosa. Is she... Did she disappear, Bonnie? Is she on? 
No, she's disappeared. She, she's one that has an old version of Zoom, so I had to promote her really quick. Okay. okay. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. I'm asking you as a resident of Belvedere Terrace to reject this project. We had you council people visit us. You know our concerns. You know that this is not NIMBYs. We're not. Um, I have been a big, big supporter of the homelessness all ever since I got to Santa Cruz 30 years ago. But please build to scale. This thing is horrible. Did you see Simon's video? Did you see it, how horrible it was? How big? I mean, what about our traffic? What about our, can, do you ever drive down the street? I know you do, one of the council people, a, a few of you who live here. It's going to be terrible. We get U-turns all the time. We're not against housing. We're against the Novan housing. Next up, I have Jackson S. Please. Okay, hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. So, hi, my name is Jackson, and I just want to voice my support for this project. I want to reiterate how severe the lack of housing is in the city, and the reason why we have such a shortage is because the city has chosen not to build for a very long time. Um, the shortage or the shortfall of housing it, of housing units is very deep, and we are stuck playing catch up for the foreseeable future. <laughs> so um, this project is part of that catching up process, which I would like to start sooner rather than later. Um, and I would also like to say that I thought the whole point of um, this project being approved via SB 35 streamlining uh, was that the only thing that really matters is being in compliance with the objective standards. So the planning department staff has reviewed the application and found that it is in compliance. So um, unless I'm missing something, uh, I, it's my understanding that this project is required to move forward and be approved. Thanks. Thank you. Next, I have Emily Hamm. Hi, good evening, Mayor Myers and members of the council. My name is Emily and I serve as executive director of the Santa Cruz County Business Council. Uh, first of all, much for your leadership um, during this process. We understand that the height and the SB 35 process are new and unfamiliar. Um, councils and, and other local, local governing bodies from across the state are also navigating new state legislation uh, that eases the creation of more affordable housing, doing so in the name of housing equity and economic sustainability. Um, state requirements and local standards are not, not arbitrary. They are put in place to reverse decades of inequitable and economically detrimental policies and practices that resulted in our current housing crisis, which is, incidentally, the single biggest threat to public health in the county and statewide. Cities do not build affordable housing themselves, but are obligated to pave the way for the development of these units. SB 35 is intended to be process and you should use it as a tool rather than an obstacle. So thank you again for your leadership on this. Thank you. Next, I think you've already spoken, so I'm going to go to Sue Terrence next. Good evening. I think that you have the power and the responsibility to deny this application on the grounds that it will have significant adverse on the health and safety of this community. According to the Geotech report commissioned by Mr. Novin, uh, the core boring show the first nine foot layer of depth under the site is composed of sand. Beneath that lies a layer of siltstone that is friable, which is defined as easily broken finger pressure and extends to a depth of 15 feet. Beneath that, to the entire 26-foot depth of the borings, lies a layer of deeply weathered, fractured siltstone characterized by extensive disintegration. This may have supported DJs in the car wash, but a five-story building with two levels of under 
policy presents a clear risk of irreparable harm and is inappropriate for the site. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I have Brooke Madison. Hello there. Thank you for listening to our comments. Can you hear me? Yes, you can. Um, something I've been thinking about a lot lately. Is the city really afraid of possible litigation by a developer, but not of its own citizens? I think you're charged with supporting and protecting us. I can think of a myriad possible litigation exa examples if this project as presented is approved. When the second bicycle down Water Street Hill on the brand new bike lane, is that time to worry about it? When the hard of hearing guy walks down the sidewalk and didn't hear the beeping of the garbage truck that's backing into the narrow service lane, then? Maybe it'll take the third rear end collision caused by those trucks so close to the intersection of water and brand support. Or maybe they just sit there and idle for 20 minutes waiting to get out on the street. It's more than possible to imagine an ambulance that didn't arrive in time for transit that was trapped in the Water Street gridlock. I lodge you and support you, and you have the power and responsibility to protect citizens. So please don't acquiesce. Remember that. It's an ill-conceived plan. Whatever you decide to allow this to be by the president. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I have Jim Burns. Hi, um, can, can you hear me? Yes, we can. We all want projects that help make housing more affordable in Santa Cruz, but that doesn't mean we should accept a development proposal like this that by any objective measure makes no effort to reduce its significant impact on the people who live, work, or travel near the project site, or accept a proposal that by any objective measure too, too many health and safety issues to detail in my one minute, or accept a proposal that, by any objective measure, cherry picks the laws, policies, and formulas that benefit one element of the application only to ignore those very same rules when it suits another part of the application, or accept a proposal that, by any objective measure, is at odds with regulations that prohibit segregated housing. As our duly elected representatives, we ask a lot of you, but more than anything else, we just need you to do the right thing. In this case, doing the right thing is, by any objective measure, sending this seriously flawed proposal back to the developer's drawing board. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we have Ryan Mickle. Hello, everybody. Uh, I just wanted to express my support for this. I'm a relatively new Santa Cruz citizen. I've only been here for about five years, just graduated from UCSC and now working on campus. I really support this project because I want to stay in Santa Cruz for the long term. And with housing the way it is, it's very difficult to see that being feasible for me. Uh, this project would give me and others like me an opportunity to stay in Santa Cruz and live in a place we really love. Um, also, being a biker, this is a really great project as it will actually help us reduce deaths getting more people on public transit, more people commuting by bike. And as long as we upgrade that infrastructure alongside projects like these, it'd be a really good thing for the active transportation community in Santa Cruz and for everybody. Getting more cars off the road means it's safer for everybody. Thank you, and I hope you approve this project. Thank you. I'm going to make one more call for folks who want to speak. Um, Bonnie, how are we doing on time? I think we're, we're doing fine on time. This will be the last call, though, for folks who want to speak. You'll have one minute. You'll need to raise your hand now so that I can um, figure out who's out there. Okay, next up is phone number ending in 1535. If you press star six, unmute yourself, please. Good evening, Mayor, members of the council. This is Ashley with the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership calling in to supplement our written letter of support for this project. As the city's first affordable housing applicant to propose a project under SB 35, we first and foremost commend all the hard work and time that's been invested on behalf of all parties, especially staff who've exceeded the amount of labor put in to ensure compliance with all objective standards pursuant to SB 35 and its density bonus request. We can attest to the level of detail and responsiveness the applicant has demonstrated in meeting all application requirements while addressing community concerns. 
As we expect to see more SB35 applications in our region, we must work all, to, all together to leverage and work with not against state legislation to tackle our housing shortage and affordability issues in the most efficient and effective way possible while focusing on social equity and environmental justice. And that's what this project is pushing the envelope to do within the current constraints of institutionalized redlining this country was built on. Please detach yourselves from the status quo observational selection self-serving bias, these loss of virgin and endowment effects that are being made. A31 water is the kind of infill transit-oriented housing the city's general plan calls for and will provide several long-term community environmental benefits to advance this project and to establish a more streamlined approval process for all incoming 35 applications that going forward. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Barbara Fargo. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go okay, ahead. thank you. Um, I am a longtime a resident of Berkeley Way, which, as I'm sure most of you know, is one street over from Belvedere Terrace. It's a very narrow street. It goes down to Reed Way and out to water. We spent years uh, dealing with various developments down at the bottom of the hill on Reed Way um, because of the traffic dangers of people coming up the Berkeley Way Hill to make to avoid the traffic light at Branson 40 and water and coming through, speeding through our neighborhood. We have lots of children on the block. We are concerned about them, as I'm sure you are also. I do not believe that this suggestion that you have very little um, uh, leeway on this is correct. You have a right to object, to oppose this project if it affects the health and safety of the residents of the city. And how you can think of sitting in traffic on the Water Street uh, Hill, making U-turns at Branson 40 um, and around to other streets in order to get out there, that doesn't affect the health and safety. I know it does, and I'm sure you do. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I have phone number ending in 2174. Press star uh, six to unmute yourself, please. Yes, thank you. Um, Jillian Greenside here. Um, I think you should back off on this. Uh, it's the first test of the 35 um, ordinance. However, it's got massive pushback, and you haven't yet developed your objective standards. There's no rush. There are other developments going on around town, and I think back off, consider, and also um, evaluate this by the objective standards. And if health and safety means anything, I can't believe that you wouldn't realise that opening <laughs> uh, a transit exit onto Water Street halfway down the hill could possibly pass muster. I actually thought your staff was a little bit um, uh, hesitant on that issue. So I think you need to look at these issues more carefully. I deny it at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Rachel McKay. Press star six. Rachel, if you're trying to get on, uh, yeah, there you go. You should be able to speak now. Let's see, Rachel, we can't hear you. Uh, if you have another device on and you're, you want to make sure whatever device you're using, you're speaking into that one. Okay, Rachel, I'll come back to you. Um, we're not able to hear you, even though you're unmuted, so I'm not quite sure exactly what's going on. Um, let me move on to phone number ending in 5-6. Unmute yourself by pressing star 6. I'm looking at phone number ending in 5690. If you unmute yourself, you'll be able to speak. Yes. 
This project does not meet the objective standards due to health and safety access into the parking racks. 143 cars coming into the project due to the backup that will be on Brant to Porty Avenue will cause cars not to be making the right-hand turn, even if you make an additional lane. This is very dangerous. This has been documented by the Vision Zero. You have the documentation. It states clearly that it's dangerous to bike riders, pedestrians, and there will definitely be problems, accidents. Our town is number two in fatalities and accidents. We have to heed this. People speaking about this project that do not live in this area really don't realize how dangerous this area can be. And this type of a downhill slant on it makes no sense. And every bit of your council should really come and observe what really would happen here so that they can have on their shoulders when those kids are coming out of school, there are two big schools right around the corner that they exit out of that. They get off school and they're going down that hill. Please deny the project. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that was our last call. I'm gonna go ahead and close this public comment period. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this back to council. Um, and I see, uh, I think council member Collentary Johnson, you've had your hand up and also uh, council member Watkins and then council member Cumming. Uh, I'll go in that. Great, thank you. Um, I just wanna first, thank and acknowledge the very, very hard work of um, the planning department and city staff. I know there's been a lot of back and forth and you've had to do a lot of adjustments and revisions and um, to the agenda report. So I wanna acknowledge and thank our staff for their work. And I wanna thank all of the um, community members who spoke up tonight, um, the developer team who came and spoke um, and the, the housing advocate folks who came and, and spoke up. Um, so as I think a lot of people, hopefully a lot of people know, I am an advocate for affordable housing um, and a wide range of housing. And, um, you know, I'm proud that up until this point, I've had a hundred percent yes vote on any housing project that's come before council since I've, I've joined the council in December. Um, this is This is really hard. This is a very challenging, proposal and situation. Um, this specific application has many challenges, which I won't go into because we've, we've been hearing about them for the last few hours. Um, but a lot of them are around health and safety impacts uh, to the surrounding community. Um, and as was mentioned, this is our first SB 35 application. So that in itself is very challenging, figuring out how to facilitate and navigate the process. Um, and we haven't even finished our, completed our objective standard uh, process that we're doing as a city, uh, currently relying on existing codes. Um, and, and I do just wanna note and say that this is a result of how we have responded or haven't responded as a community um, in terms of housing. Our local opposition in past years um, are saying no too many times has brought us here. And, and now this is the outcome. <laughs> this project that is not aligned with our vision as a community of equity and health and sustainability, which we've explicitly named um, in a ways in health and all policies, vision zero, our climate action plans, it's not aligned. And, and beyond not being aligned with our values, um, like I said, it, after diving deep into the hundreds and hundreds of pages, I, I do see the impacts of health and safety on our community. Um, I'd really like to use this as an opportunity to invite developers, investors, invite housing advocates, and the community at large to really pause and think about where we're at um, and to come together to build projects that, that work for our community, to build a project for this site that includes 100% affordable housing. Um, I don't think this project is it. Um, I do think that there are concessions and um, what's listed as minor deficiencies that don't seem like minor, they seem major, that, um, that are a basis for denial for the project. 
Um, I, I want to just note quickly on concession one and segregation that's been brought up several times. Um, this was brought up earlier in the afternoon, but I, I question the true intent of the segregation of the two units and, and whether it will be um, a way to facilitate and maneuver uh, abandonment of the affordable housing um, building, the affordable housing component of this project. Um, so, you know, this is this is difficult, but after much thought and, and really looking into the components of the packet and um, listening and uh, taking in everything that everyone has said, um, I am in the opinion of the, that the deficiencies outlined in the agenda report are not minor and that the concessions do impact health and safety and can be measured in a quantifiable way. Uh, and again, are the basis for denial. So, so with that, I would like to make a motion to deny the project based on the lack of evidence that it will meet the city's objective standard. And I'll just pause there. Uh, we have a motion on the table. Council Member Watkins. Uh, I'll second the motion. And we have a motion uh, that to deny the project based on the um, objective standards, not meeting the objective standards. Um, Council member, if you might have that motion up, maybe you could put that up. If you have it written down, that might be helpful um, based on meeting uh, not meeting objective standards. We have a second to that. And uh, let's see, I've got council member Cummings next. Uh, Mayor, but I also have a few comments if I could. I'm sorry, I didn't know. Okay, go for it. No, no problem. Um, I want to thank, I, you know, I share a lot of the comments that have been made by my colleague, and I too want to thank all that were present here and those who couldn't be present, those that participated in the um, Padlet process and spoke out and have been engaged in housing from, from various perspectives over time. Um, I want to thank our staff because I do know that they've been working very, very hard to also interpret this new law and um, all that accompanies it in terms of its challenges. And I share a lot of the concerns that were raised by Councilmember Kalantari Johnson in regards to just feeling that this does not meet the standards that we'd like to see. I too have been, um, you know, I, I, I approach housing in a way that I try to find compromise and I know it's not always easy. William B or NIMBY or, you know, all or nothing, or you you are for affordable housing or you're not, and you just want market rate. It's so easy to fall into these very black and white positions, but often what I try to find is a place where we're aiming for good, but not perfect. And that we are authentically listening to each other and trying to make modifications to hear each other. And uh, often not everybody um, you know, a, a place for their voice to, to be heard to the way they want it to be. But generally, the majority can come in the middle and say, I can live with this. And this is our joint and, and universal value of wanting to see uh, more housing and inroads to affordability here in our community. And I feel that that is a really critical component to getting really good projects um, moving forward. And that this for me uh, lacks, and I think it really speaks out by the public comment that we've heard. And I think it kind of speaks to just the SB 35 process. And I, I get it, I understand why the state uh, made that, uh, that policy decision. I understand where we're at as a state in terms of our affordability issues and, and housing. I turn around it not meeting really the standards to the level that I'd like to see. I do have concern about the segregated housing. And I hear when people say, you know, we do have that because we try to make those leverage points in terms of um, how we use some of the um, incentives. And on one parcel, really segregating two buildings via a kind of a pathway a bridge, you know, doesn't settle well for me. And, and frankly, I think that is known in terms of our history as a nation that you know, often those that really fall into the affordability are people of color or low economic um, individuals, right? And so I just, I, I can't, I can't, um, I reconcile that personally. And so I don't feel comfortable with that concession. And for a number of reasons, I feel that there are uh, 
there's evidence that really shows that we don't necessarily have uh, what we need to approve it at this time. And so I um, am happy to second the motion as it as it was presented and um, interested in further conversation with my colleagues in regards to moving forward. Councilmember, I just wanna make sure Councilmember uh, Contrary Johnson that we got the language. Um, I was not able to write it down, it was so quick. Um, I, I don't know that this was fully the full motion. I don't know if you have a, it written down. Um, and I would assume it should uh, say that it does not meet the city's. I, I did send, um, after uh, this was put up, I sent it to, to Bonnie. Um, okay. It's pretty close, let's see. Okay. That it, that it, yeah, that it does not meet. Okay. So that was incorrect on my part. And um, I just want to let the, the applicant know and his attorney, uh, Amara, that, um, Amara, that with, this is a council deliberation time, so we actually do not engage um, with uh, folks from the audience at this point in time um, until the motion has been uh, voted on, really until we've made the decision this evening. So um, I just want to let you know that. Um, I'll move on to council. So this is the current language um, that the motion has. And I'll go ahead and uh, call on council member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, staff, for the presentation and for the community and for the developer for joining us this evening. My questions were asked by my colleagues earlier. And I just want to make a couple of statements regarding the project and, um, to to clarify um, my intent this evening. So uh, yeah, as many of us know, cities throughout the state of California have been stripped of their authority related to local control over land use decisions. And as a result, we're here this evening to review objective standards and determine whether the project that's before us meets all the objective standards um, for approval. There are a number of assumptions that have been made that studies that are underway will allow the project to meet objective standards but given that today we don't have the results of any of these studies and any evidence before us that would allow us to definitively say that the project will meet our objective standards, we cannot say that the project meets our objective standards. Um, as a proponent of affordable housing I've, and a proponent of housing, I voted to support the construction of hundreds of units of housing, um, many of which have been uh, affordable and um, some that I didn't 100% agree with. And I would be supportive, and I think many of the community members would be supportive of a 100% affordable project on the site that meets the city's objective standards. But it's clear that not only are there many objections to this, but there are also many concerns around the objective standards uh, that aren't being met. So on behalf of the community members that have expressed concern, I've also um, prepared some of what would have been a motion, but now I would like to propose it as a friendly amendment to the motion that's on the floor. <clears throat> so, um, speaker of the motion has already denied the A31 water project for its um, based on um, it not meeting the objective standards. And I think it's important that we outline some of these objective standards so we have explicit objective standards that the city can uh, lean on when they're um, when if the, when and if this goes to court. So, one, <clears throat> the anti-segregation standard and the inclusionary ordinance and density bonus ordinance that requires the dispersal of affordable units project, which also violates our health and all policy ordinance by creating segregated housing. Two, um, that the objective standards around the slope regulation, that, that the project be located no closer than 20 feet from a 30% slope without a variance. Three, the lack of a completed stormwater management plan and a completed drainage plan that ensures the city's standards to prevent flooding on the property and in the neighborhood. For the lack of a traffic study demonstrating that the city's traffic standards protecting the public health and safety from the proposed driveway crossing of bike lane. And five, the lack of a completed noise study documenting that the city's objective noise standards will be met. And in addition to the SB 35, deem that the, the density bonus application incom be incomplete for not complying with the state housing and community developments regular affordable units are distributed throughout the development and for not showing the breakdown of, of area median income levels and density bonus unit locations. Um, so that's the friendly amendment. If it's not accepted as a friendly, I'm happy to move uh, an amendment to the motion. But, you know, for the members of the public and everyone who's watching, you know, without having results from studies that will evaluate 
whether or not the project will meet our objective standards to mitigate health and safety impacts on local residents. The city should not, in good faith, approve this project and should deny the project based on the reasons expressed. And so with that, I'll end my comments. And if, as I mentioned before, um, I'm happy to make this as a friendly amendment. If it's not accepted as a friendly amendment, I'm prepared to make uh, a motion to amend the main motion. Look to the maker of the motion. I'll accept the friendly amendment. Thank you, Council. And is the seconder okay with these changes? Yes. Uh, I'll move on to Council Member Brown. So I, um, I just want to say very quickly um, that I am going to support the motion. I um, share the concerns that have been expressed by my colleagues on the council, um, and I recognize that we are here to speak directly to whether or not uh, this project, as currently proposed, meets objective standards. Um, I won't repeat what's already been said, um, but it's pretty clear to me in and I appreciate that our staff has spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to how to navigate this. Um, you know, we've had a lot of documents come our way. You know, we've been talking with people, and you know, some of the documents seemingly ever changing. And so, you know, trying to um, turn this around after getting something on a Friday so that you're we're ready to have information. You know, I, I just want to say I really appreciate that staff has, has done your level best to to make that um, and um, and still, despite your best efforts, I do not believe that um, the application itself meets those objective stand certain objective standards. So I'll be supporting the motion. I appreciate. Um, you know, the other concerns that have been raised that we're, you know, I'm not going to talk about, but I just want for the community members of the public who are listening, I hear you. Um, and I think valid. Um, that's not the reason I'm voting uh, no uh, uh, to deny the project tonight. Um, that is strictly based upon the objective standards criteria evaluation. Um, and I'll just leave it there. Thanks. Thank you, council member. Are there any other council member comments at this time? Make sure. Okay. Um, I just maybe, uh, I would just like to make a few comments as well. Um, it's been a, this has been an incredibly difficult project. I mean, this has kind of hit the streets about almost a year ago. Um, there's been repeated attempts to try to find um, some common cause with neighborhood that obviously um, knew they were uh, living next to some commercial area or mixed use area that may someday get, um, you know, get developed, um, purchased and developed into another use. And I think, you know, I don't think there is any doubt that folks who live in this neighborhood, you know, acknowledge that. I think what really strikes me is, is really the waivers for the project and, and those are the things fit with, you know, the, the feeling of a neighborhood and, and those things are not available now um, as things that we can we can uh, weigh a project against. Um, and I did hear quite a bit tonight about, um, you know, things that the state has said in, these, in this legislation that they have passed, but we didn't have a voice in any of those legislative actions. We are a local government governed by seven people on a, sitting on a city council. Um, and this is a sign of, you know, uh, a, an actual very complex sort of land use push by our state legislature. Um, and, you know, the values that we have in our general plan have been in that general plan for almost a decade. Um, and those values were expressed through hundreds of people participating in the general plan. And one of the most important things is that we want to affordable units be integrated amongst all housing types. We um, we do not want to separate out buildings because that is now a stated mandate by California. Um, sometimes as an elected official, you have to speak for your community and not just, um, you know, get pushed around by the state of California, frankly. Um, I too am a, a affordable housing advocate. Um, and have worked every time, every minute on the council to push as far as I can for getting projects done. 
um, up against a lot of folks who do not want those projects done. And I think every affordable unit is worth building. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not focused on getting the win every time, but if I can get a unit built um, as part of a, as part of a, uh, you know, a market rate uh, project, then that's a, that's a win. Every unit that provides affordability for someone in this town is a win for me. Um, and I do believe that this site provide those things um, if, 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 if there is a willingness to work with the neighborhood and work with your city government and work with your city leaders. Um, it's an important site. It's a key site. It's uh, a wonderful site has been mentioned on all sides for um, the kinds of housing that we have envisioned. And that was really envisioned in our general plan. And we did, we were doing things in our general plan that other cities weren't even touching back 10 years ago. So, um, you know, there's frustration uh, and, um, you know, instead of having this project be such a divisive project, I really hope that um, uh, this is a learning moment right now um, and that we can hopefully, um, you know, get back to the drawing board um, and try to create something that's going to work and get support. Uh, I am going to support the motion tonight. And uh, I just want to recognize that um, I do also share uh, concerns about some of the lack of information um, as well as uh, really being able to um, fully feel like I am making a vote that um, is uh, in the public health and safety component of the community. So um, I just wanted to close with some comments. I don't know if any of my other colleagues want to have any uh, have any uh, any uh, comments at all tonight. Okay, so we'll go ahead and move to the motion we have. A motion uh, by Council Member Kondari Johnson, seconded by Council Member Watkins, with a friendly amended amendment from Council Member Cummings, um, which is uh, to deny the project based on the lack of evidence that it does not meet the city's objective standards. Uh, there has been uh, a number of uh, these five specific standards that are mentioned. Uh, and then secondly, to deem the density bonus application incomplete for not complying with the state housing and community developments regulation that affordable units are distributed throughout the development and for not showing the breakdown of AMI levels and density bonus unit locations. And I'll go ahead and ask for a roll call vote, please. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Watkins? Aye. <coughs> Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Um, Minx? Aye. Golder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? I will be voting no. I would just like to say that this is not a public hearing and this public oversight uh, uh, purpose and role was to recognize subjective standards as outlined by staff and um, the health and safety concerns brought forward uh, will not be ignored and as stated earlier will come later in the process for example with the building permit assessment that the city will be doing so our role for this uh, purpose. Uh, I do recognize that it's standard, so I will be voting no. And Mayor Myers. I'm a yes. That motion passes six four and one against, one no. Um, that concludes our meeting this evening, and uh, we will uh, be reconvening at our next council meeting on October. 26. Um, so tonight we are adjourned. Thank you everyone for attending. Good night. Goodbye.